Bene, buongiorno, buongiorno a eh, tutte e eh, a tutti. Eh, Grazie di eh, essere qui per questo secondo giorno eh, della conferenza internazionale organizzata da INAP, l'Istituto Nazionale per l'Analisi delle Politiche Pubbliche, eh, sul tema di, eh, dei lavoratori e eh, imprese nell'economia eh, nell delle eh, piattaforme. Eh, abbiamo avuto ieri un eh, primo eh, giorno molto intenso ehm, e eh, eh, sia eh, diciamo in termini di chiarificazioni concettuali e eh, di discussione sulla, eh, su che cos'è eh, l'economia eh, delle, eh, delle piattaforme, sia eh, andando a vedere diciamo, i eh, dati eh, empirici su lavoratori e eh, imprese eh, e ehm, anche iniziando ad analizzare i eh, principali eh, problemi eh, eh, dell'economia eh, delle eh, piattaforme. Um, a me eh, questa mattina, diciamo, eh, riflettendo sulla giornata di eh, ieri, eh, sono venuti eh, diciamo in mente eh, due episodi o eh, eh, due aneddoti. Eh, il primo, eh, un tempo in Italia c'era il servizio eh, militare obbligatorio e dovevi fare la visita, eh, la visita di leva. E eh, ricordo che durante appunto la mia eh, visita di leva e dovevi segnare insomma tra le informazioni personali eh, su un foglio anche se eri occupato e che tipo di lavoro eh, svolgevi. Mi ricordo che durante la mia dopo un po' è tornato il sergente immagino poi io sono non l'ho fatto il militare quindi non conosco bene i gradi ma eh, eh, è tornato il, eh, il sergente eh, chiamando chi è Mario Rossi eh, sono io imbecille. Secondo te consegnare le guide del telefono, le pagine gialle è un lavoro? Allora, ragionando su quello che abbiamo visto ieri, eh, vediamo come eh, è cambiato il eh, mondo in eh, alcuni decenni, ma eh, non così tanti. Eh, un altro, un altro eh, diciamo, eh, ep episodio che mi aveva colpito era che prima della, 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 housing, della, della bolla del mercato immobiliare eh, statunitense eh, nel 2008, prima che la bolla scoppiasse nel, eh, nel 2008 in connessione alla fi la crisi eh, finanziaria, eh, varie diciamo, banche e istituzioni finanziarie statunitensi, eh, oltre ad accettare come collaterale diciamo, per eh, concedere mutui sulla prima casa eh, le, eh, eh, le mance eh, dei eh, camerieri diciamo, nei, eh, nei ristoranti, eh, utilizzavano come indicatore di credito, eh, di rischio di credito e, e, e eh, eh, credit rating, eh, utilizzavano eh, le stellette su eBay, hm? il, il, eh, eh, eBay ratings. E anche questo ti fa capire come eh, sia cambiata eh, l'economia. Ehm, eh, eh, ieri dicevo abbiamo eh, eh, lavorato insomma sulla, sulla eh, aspetti di chiarificazione eh, dei concetti, che cos'è eh, la gig economy eh, eh, sotto insieme dei platform, eh, eh, che cos'è la sharing economy, eh, eh, questi, questi concetti sono eh, spesso diciamo, eh, eh, non chiari e eh, confusi, eh, certamente come dire, nel dibattito pubblico, ma eh, anche eh, a questo stadio nel dibattito eh, accademico abbiamo visto come eh, si può lavorare eh, anche a livello europeo in particolare per eh, trovare delle definizioni eh, condivise. Um, e abbiamo visto anche eh, quali sono le similarità ma anche le differenze tra queste varie forme diciamo, dell'economia eh, della, eh, dell eh, delle eh, piattaforme. Un aspetto eh, che è emerso chiaramente è che eh, come dire, non bisogna eh, adottare una posizione eh, di determinismo, eh, non, non c'è nulla di automaticamente eh, determinato. Eh, mh, anche come dire, a, 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 alla luce delle differenze, eh, il, eh, le, la politica pubblica può intervenire per, eh, attraverso regolazione, attraverso eh, nudge, eh, attraverso varie forme per indirizzare diciamo, eh, sia la configurazione eh, sia gli esiti poi eh, in termini di 
eh, opportunità di vita per eh, eh, gli individui, ehm, la, eh, eh, la forma diciamo, può indirizzare eh, eh, la forma delle, eh, eh, e, e lo sviluppo dell'economia delle eh, piattaforme. Eh, in particolare non tutto è eh, gig economy, non tutto è economia, eh, eh, diciamo, dei, a volte si usa in italiano con un'espressione sgradevole, economia dei lavoretti, ma questa è la traduzione di gigs. Eh, 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 noi abbiamo in mente, e lo vediamo in questi giorni, eh, Fudora, eh, Deliveroo, eh, Just Eat, eh, eh, piattaforme che, eh, eh, diciamo, di consegna di pasti a domicilio, la protesta dei, eh, dei riders, i, i eh, possibili, diciamo, tentativi di eh, regolazione. Mm, quest questo pezzo è importante, non è importante quantitativamente, non c'è solo questo pezzo nell'economia delle piattaforme, l'economia delle piattaforme è anche Google, Amazon, eh, eh, Facebook che fanno eh, in realtà ricavi molto elevati. Tut tutte queste eh, piattaforme però sono accomunate da qualcosa, cioè creano poca occupazione, creano pochi posti di lavoro. Alcune sono a basso valore aggiunto, altre sono ad altissimo valore aggiunto, tutte creano poca occupazione. Quelle ad altissimo valore aggiunto poi pagano anche tendenzialmente poche tasse, quantomeno poche tasse nel paese in cui operano. Utilizzano diciamo, gli strumenti consentiti dall'economia digitale per trasferire eh, il, eh, eh, il valore aggiunto altrove e pagare tasse in paesi dove la tassazione è diversa e evidentemente più favorevole, ma più in generale c'è un modello di eh, business che non guarda al profitto come remunerazione del capitale, anche perché molto spesso il capitale operativo di queste piattaforme è molto basso, eh, l'obiettivo è quello di massimizzare il valore, queste sono società quotate, massimizzare il valore delle azioni, molto spesso perché il management ottiene, proprio possiede delle quote molto ingenti di tali azioni. Quindi è un modello mh, diverso eh, che non è eh, diciamo nuovissimo in realtà, è tipico di una, certe eh, economie, economie di mercato liberali vengono eh, chiamate eh, in letteratura, nelle quali essenzialmente l'obiettivo è la massimizzazione del valore delle azioni eh, delle, eh, delle eh, imprese. Ehm, e molto spesso il management non è remunerato direttamente o la remunerazione diretta è bassa, diretta in remunerazione del loro lavoro, la remunerazione del management avviene proprio in azioni, per cui il management ha un interesse nel distribuire relativamente pochi utili e invece nell'aumentare il corso eh, azionario. Dicevo però che ehm, tornando alle piattaforme di lavoro, di consegna dei pasti ad esempio, eh, queste sono una fetta molto, queste certamente non hanno alto valore aggiunto, non di loro eh, stavo parlando poc'anzi sul corso eh, delle azioni, eh, hanno, eh, quindi sono un pezzo piccolino diciamo, dell'economia delle piattaforme, ma è molto importante per segnalare una tendenza, una tendenza generalizzata, che, eh, una tendenza che riguarda eh, diciamo le, eh, eh, le relazioni il, eh, eh, di eh, lavoro, la, la forma diciamo, eh, 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 di eh, lavoro eh, eh, e quindi è importante per la qualità del lavoro. Eh, il, eh, questa tendenza diciamo, è verso una, eh, eh, quella che è stata chiamata eh, eh, Fissuring, eh, eh, fessurazione, eh, eh, sgretolamento, diciamo, di eh, quella che era un tempo eh, eh, il lavoro standard eh, a tempo pieno e eh, indeterminato, ehm, eh, che eh, diciamo accomuna tutte eh, le grandi eh, economie, eh, segnalo come negli ultimi anni, indipendentemente da differenze regolative o anche da riforme che sono state adottate sia negli Stati Uniti, sia nel Regno Unito, sia in Italia, eh, la maggiore occupazione, cioè la creazione di posti di lavoro, è avvenuta eminentemente attraverso contratti non standard e in particolare contratti di durata prefissata eh, a termine. 
ehm, questo eh, eh, segnala diciamo, una tendenza molto, molto forte anche in connessione con il eh, cambiamento eh, tecnologico. Eh, dicevo quindi che eh, l'economia, la gig eh, economy, l'economia eh, delle piattaforme eh, di lavoro, di consegna pasti e così via, e eh, eh, relativamente piccola in termini eh, sia occupazionali sia diciamo di, di, di fatturato, ma importante per eh, eh, il, eh, eh, il concetto diciamo di eh, eh, relazione, eh, eh, di, eh, relazione di eh, lavoro, eh, il, il, il ti, i tipi di contratti che vengono, eh, che vengono eh, adottati ehm, e eh, eh, segnala appunto una tendenza diffusa eh, nei mh, diciamo mercati del lavoro eh, contemporanei, cioè quella di eh, datori di lavoro che mantengono il potere datoriale senza assumersene i rischi. Tradizionalmente il, la, il, la standard employment uh, relationship, il, il contratto di lavoro a tempo pieno e indeterminato, che cos'è? Eh, diciamo è eh, eh, potere datoriale, potere di eh, organizzazione e direzione da parte del eh, datore di lavoro in cambio di un'assicurazione a un certo grado eh, contro i rischi eh, eh, di, eh, eh, della domanda eh, 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 nei confronti del eh, lavoratore. Il lavoratore è tutelato da un contratto di lavoro eh, che può essere certamente eh, risolto ma solo in presenza diciamo, di cause codificate e con una, eh, la possibilità eh, eh, di eh, chiedere al, al giudice eh, di valutare la sussistenza di queste cause. Cioè potere di organizzazione e direzione, potere datoriale in cambio eh, di assunzione da parte del, del, scusate, da parte del datore di lavoro eh, dei rischi. Eh, invece andiamo verso una situazione in cui si mantiene attraverso varie forme eh, come dire, formalizzate e non il potere datoriale ma senza assunzione di rischi e quindi quello che eh, politologi americani hanno chiamato il grande spostamento del rischio, the great risk shift, nei confronti verso, diciamo, i, eh, 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 verso le famiglie, verso gli individui da un lato o verso lo Stato eh, nella misura in cui lo Stato poi deve provvedere alla protezione sociale di questi lavoratori. Um, il, eh, eh, questo quindi come dire, configura quasi una nuova questione sociale come eh, a metà eh, del, eh, del 1800, una questione sociale che all'epoca diede poi luogo alla nascita dei welfare state contemporanei come eh, li eh, conosciamo. Allora è evidente che ci sono eh, quindi questioni eh, di eh, diritti e eh, di rappresentazione diciamo, di, questi, eh, eh, di questi o di rappresentanza eh, di questi eh, diritti. Eh, tradizionalmente eh, la eh, diciamo, teoria delle risorse di potere ti dice eh, come eh, eh, i lavoratori sono riusciti eh, ad acquisire eh, diritti attraverso l'azione di eh, attori collettivi, partiti socialdemocratici tendenzialmente e, eh, eh, e sindacati eh, dei eh, lavoratori. Eh, gli uni essenzialmente agiscono eh, nel, nel, diciamo, attraverso eh, la regolazione del sistema eh, fiscale, cioè la tassazione, eh, tassazione per eh, poi finanziare prestazioni di protezione sociale. Eh, gli altri agiscono, in una, i sindacati agiscono in, una, in uno stadio precedente, cioè de, quello della distribuzione primaria del reddito, cioè agiscono perché ci sia una distribuzione del reddito eh, più eh, equa. Allora, conosciamo bene lo stato dei partiti socialdemocratici, quantomeno in, eh, in Europa, eh, eh, e, eh, e anche eh, probabilmente delle, eh, dei sindacati dei lavoratori, eh, peraltro, eh, e questo sarà il tema diciamo, di questa mattina, eh, molto spesso eh, questi attori tendono ancora come dire, ad avere lo sguardo rivolto all'indietro, eh, cioè alla... Eh, alla ehm, 
a quella standard employment eh, relationship, eh, eh, a, quella, eh, eh, a quelle forme di regolazione del, eh, mercato, eh, del, della, della, del mercato del lavoro ehm, che eh, eh, sempre meno eh, tendono a creare eh, occupazione eh, come, eh, come abbiamo visto. Ehm, e questo sarà il tema di questa eh, mattina. Eh, il, il, il tema sia di analisi ma poi del passaggio alle, eh, eh, a che cosa fare in termini di eh, politica eh, pubblica ehm, sia relativamente alle relazioni eh, industriali ehm, sia relativamente alla protezione eh, sociale sia più in generale attraverso strumenti eh, regolativi, strumenti regolativi sull'employment eh, eh, sull relationship, strumenti regolativi quindi sulla forma eh, 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 di eh, lavoro, ma anche, che è ciò di cui si parla con insistenza in Italia in questi giorni, eh, ma anche eh, credo sia importante eh, discutere di regolazione della tassazione, hm? Eh, e più in generale della regolazione dell'esercizio di potere, hm? abbiamo stabilito che c'è la bilancia, eh, l'equilibrio eh, eh, bi, eh, eh, di potere eh, eh, si è spostato negli ultimi anni tra eh, diciamo imprese e in particolare imprese nella platform economy e eh, lavoratori, eh, eh, come eh, eh, diciamo, regolare l'esercizio di potere eh, eh, all'interno di queste eh, relazioni. Da un lato trattando come eh, o, 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 trattando eh, le imprese diciamo, eh, globali o le imprese che mh, eh, utilizzano l'economia eh, delle piattaforme come business as usual eh, oppure no, eh, cioè adottando regolazioni specifiche, dall'altro cercando di eh, fare sviluppare, fare fiorire eh, il eh, cooperativismo delle eh, piattaforme anche a livello, eh, a livello locale, tutti aspetti dei quali abbiamo iniziato a discutere eh, ieri e eh, che eh, certamente costituiranno la base per la discussione nella, eh, nel panel eh, di questa mattina. Eh, io eh, ringrazio il dottor eh, Gianni eh, Rosas dell'ILO del, eh, del, dell eh, eh, dell'ufficio italiano eh, dell'International Labour eh, Organization ehm, per eh, eh, condurre eh, il panel eh, di questa mattina e condurlo con la competenza eh, propria eh, diciamo, di, un, eh, di un funzionario eh, di questa eh, grande organizzazione internazionale che eh, è dedicata esattamente diciamo, eh, eh, all'analisi e all'intervento sui temi eh, del lavoro. Good morning everyone, uh, I hope you had a nice evening yesterday, particularly for the colleagues coming from abroad, I hope that you managed to surely to enjoy the nightlife in Rome, and also the Italian food. Um, I would just like to say a few words uh, uh, to introduce this uh, very interesting and rich uh, panel. Um, we will have in the course of this morning Uh, se seven presenters talking about uh, regulatory and jurisdictional issues uh, on the platform economy. I don't want to get into details also because uh, uh, President Saki made my task easier introducing the, the, the panel of this morning. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, one uh, relates to the fact uh, uh, that uh, digital platforms have attracted uh, Uh, recently a lot of uh, attention by the research community which is uh, represented today in this room, uh, but also by policymakers, by uh, organized labor, by the media and the public at large. And this is uh, certainly due to the fact of the pace uh, with which uh, uh, these uh, platforms have developed. Uh, but also to the issues that uh, Stefano was mentioning, uh, particularly uh, in respect of uh, the ways uh, in which work uh, is performed uh, and the relationship uh, between the actors involved uh, in, uh, in the both the demand and the supply of labor. Historically, uh, labor regulations and uh, labor market institutions have had uh, the function of uh, establishing the rules of the game, no? to uh, 
establish ground rules uh, for uh, uh, labor markets that we know that they are uh, by nature imperfect, as well as uh, uh, what Stefano was mentioning of the unequal uh, power that exists between uh, uh, the uh, employer and between the worker. So, and finally also they have had uh, uh, a function of organizing work. Um, so this, uh, as, uh, we were, as it was just mentioned, uh, has triggered a lot of discussions, particularly in respect uh, of what we have been knowing uh, in terms of employment relationship. And uh, uh, of, of course, the issues also mentioned by uh, Professor Saki in respect of taxation and in, this in, in respect of the employment relation in, uh, in general, and they, how to say, how to rebalance uh, the, the power between these actors. Um, in the course of the panel of this morning, we will hear from colleagues uh, different perspective when it, ca when it comes to uh, regulating uh, and uh, um, the, how to say this, the employment relationship. So we will hear uh, most likely about uh, how do the current uh, uh, regulations fit uh, uh, to the context of uh, the platform economy and uh, if uh, and whether there is a need uh, to uh, review the, the regulatory system with a view of uh, continuing to exert the, the function that uh, labor regulations have played uh, uh, up to now. I don't want to get more in depth uh, with uh, the introduction. I would just like to say that, as it was mentioned, we will also see uh, and hear about uh, uh, issues relating to conditions of work uh, and employment, to, th to the issues relating to representation of workers, but also of employers, uh, as well as issues uh, relating to social protection of, uh, of workers. Um, there are a few aspects that uh, I wanted to, how to, say, to share with the panelists. First of all, this discussion is hosted and organized by the Institute, Italian Institute for Public Policy. So it would be very interesting for us to hear from you what are the takeaways uh, uh, in the course of your presentation or the implications for uh, policy making. I think that one of the, the key objectives of the Institute is uh, to uh, conduct research to inform uh, the policy choices of, uh, of um, policy makers with uh, evidence. And also one thing, um, there are two things that are at least of my particular interest. One is uh, the issue of labor uh, intermediation. Uh, as we know, uh, this is not, a, uh, having a private uh, uh, intermediators is not a new thing. Uh, but just because of the fact that labor is not a commodity, this has been uh, somehow uh, underpinned by uh, basic regulations concerning the functioning and monitoring of, uh, of uh, these uh, intermediators. So it would be interesting also to know from you how do you see uh, this working, uh, you know, compared, for instance, or in comparison between uh, private uh, employment agencies, as we have known, and also inter intermediation by uh, platform economies. And also, I wanted to, to quote uh, um, something that was quite interesting in yesterday's discussion that was mentioned particularly by the representative of the Italian Statistical Institute of uh, a relationship that uh, uh, often uh, involves uh, uh, actors that they are based uh, in different countries. No? We, we, we heard the colleague from ETUE about uh, uh, having uh, uh, some actors based in Madagascar, others in Belgium. You may have the employer or the platform that is based in another country. So it would be interesting to know from you to, which, uh, to what extent you see also how to say, how this could be handled and if there is a need of having either at regional or international level a framework uh, that uh, can help uh, managing this, uh, how to say, this, uh, th th these situations of, or these workers without borders. With this, I give the floor to Professor Vina Dubal from the University of California Hastings 
who will be talking, who will be delivering a keynote uh, on uh, collective action of Uber drivers in the US. Uh, and she will focus her presentation on how unions, drivers and regulators have responded to, to this uh, collective action. Professor Dubal, the floor is yours. They were on the um, USB. Ah, okay. So thank you so, so much um, to INAP and to Dario for facilitating this wonderful, interesting um, conference, and it's an honor to be on this esteemed panel. So at the turn of the 19th century, it was the cotton mill that was symbolically equated with new industrial society. As English historian E.P. Thompson famously noted, the cotton mill as a novel piece of industrial technology represented both new forms of production and the social relationships that those new forms of production entailed. So just as observers in the mid 1800s were intrigued by the novelty of the factory and the technologies associated with it, US policymakers, academics, journalists in this digital moment are consumed by the novelty of app-based technologies and the so-called transformation of service work. In this widespread discussion and analysis, Uber, both the corporate entity and the app, has become the symbolic cotton mill to today's service sector. The cotton mill, however, was not the driving force behind the massive political and social and economic transformation of the Industrial Revolution. The transformation was attributable not to the machine itself, but to capital's restructuring of work around the machine, to the state's response to that restructuring, and to the collective resistance of the working class amidst these public and private reorderings of work. In my making, what we see with the platform-based service economy is not at all analogous to the Industrial Revolution in size or scale. Indeed, in the US just last week, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released numbers to suggest that the service-based gig economy is much smaller than many of us imagined. Nevertheless, Uber represents our collective anxieties about digitalization, the so-called transformation of service work, and the political pathologies and economic inequalities associated with widespread labor deregulation. In the past half decade in the US as elsewhere, Uber has become a topic of much regulatory discussion, in large part because of the possibilities for wide-scale change that it represents. While the number of, of workers relative to the larger labor market are not staggering, the amount of venture capital that has been invested in the company, the company's well-funded regulatory arbitrage, and the complete transformation of the taxi industry has been nothing short of mesmerizing for observers. Uber, it turns out, is the most well-financed unicorn in all of Silicon Valley, well outpacing even the security firm Palantir. Um, as Ivana Pais and Julie Shore stated yesterday, I'm not confident that the Uber app model is necessarily transferable across industries or that it will have anywhere near the kind of impact that the technologies associated with factory production had two centuries ago. But in so much as it represents the intensification of labor trends we have been witnessing for the past 40 years, what the digitalization of service work might look like, and also a new moral world, it is worthy of our attention. That said, my focus on Uber happened much by accident. A decade, decade ago, I was a public interest attorney representing taxi workers in San Francisco. 
Taxi workers, like Uber drivers in the U.S., have been considered independent contractors since the 1970s, when taxi companies rid themselves of unions through a business reordering and a shift from supplying wages to renting taxis to drivers. In the U.S., in the post-World War II period, independent contractors were carved out of all employment and labor law protections by Congress. Businesses in the service economy, including taxi companies, construction companies, and even nail salons, changed their business models to rid themselves of the costs associated with U.S.-based employment. They made their workers independent contractors because in the U.S., our safety net system is almost entirely tied to work. Workers are either employees or independent contractors, and corporations with employees pay roughly 15 to 20 percent more than corporations with independent contractors. Yes. Um, this history of the legal and regulatory shifts in the taxi industry and their impact on taxi workers was the subject of my doctoral dissertation some years later. I was struck at how little interest there was in taxi workers. This largely immigrant workforce was, in my making, symbolic of the most vulnerable workers in the U.S. Then, as now, I was interested in how these workers, who were carved out of employment and labor law protections, including the right to organize, resisted their precarious working conditions. As it turned out, even without union support, taxi workers organized to form worker centers, they went on strike, and negotiated the terms of their income and hours with both taxi companies and regulatory bodies. So why are Uber drivers today so much less organized than taxi drivers have historically been? When taxi drivers lost union status in the late 1970s, they still benefited from the regulatory structure that the union had left them. And they continued to have driver leaders who maintained, to a limited degree, the fight the union began. Fascinatingly, many of the San Francisco taxi driver leaders today are ones who have driven in the industry since before the taxi union dissolved in the late 1970s. Still, we might expect that Uber drivers in the U.S. would be more organized than they are. In fact, Uber drivers are better positioned than most gig workers to mobilize collectively. First, and perhaps most importantly, the high level of control that Uber exercises over work conditions generates many shared complaints among drivers. Second, and relatedly, drivers share a single common grievance, a uh, target of grievance, Uber. Third, spaces exist where drivers congregate and where they have the potential to get to know one another, such as waiting lots at airports. Fourth, drivers have generated several active online forums and blogs that are available for exchange of information and coordination. Nevertheless, even with these relative advantages, Uber drivers are far less organized than taxi workers have been historically. Indeed, by and large, Uber drivers in the U.S. have not been able to engage in collective action to demand changes from the company or in the political arena to demand regulations from the state. Uh, my research with Ruth Collier suggests that nationally, between 2014 and 2017, Uber drivers staged 42 protest, protests and work stoppages, each with less than 30 participants, and in some cases, far less than 30. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given the small number of participants, almost no regulations or laws in the U.S. at the city, state, or national level have addressed any of the many grievances or uh, Uber drivers despite the amount of attention that these grievances get. The question then is why? Why do we see such little collective action among workers and why the complete lack of regulatory action with regard to driver grievances? So to get at this, I uh, did what amounted to essentially a 10-year ethnography of taxi workers and eventually Uber drivers in San Francisco who were working toward collective action. In addition, I observed regulatory hearings at the city and state level and closely followed lawsuits and other legal investigations that impacted drivers in the industry. Um, along with Ruth Collier, I conducted a survey of 200 plus Uber drivers in San Francisco, which included about two dozen semi-structured follow-up interviews. 
And I should note that all of my observations about Uber drivers are made with the backdrop of the taxi industry in mind. Why is what I observed with workers in the taxi industry so different than what I observed with workers doing the same work, but through an app? Um, so before I get to answering that question, first let me address what drivers are actually angry about. What are their grievances? These are the main grievances that we identified in our research. With the exception of privacy and data concerns, the everyday grievances of Uber drivers were largely the same as the grievances of taxi drivers in my earlier research. The primary concerns raised by Uber drivers in the US are, unsurprisingly, the same that service workers have always raised, that they work too hard and too long for too little. Nuances nonetheless exist. The important grievance distinctions from the taxi drivers just years before, which I've highlighted in blue, are with regard to time inflexibility, not flexibility, and wage instability. While taxi drivers consistently complained about their low pay, they did not experience rate drops because their rates are regulated by the state. Nor did they bear the costs of the car or insurance, which were both borne by the taxi companies. Taxi drivers also work by shifts, unlike Uber drivers. So as I've shown in some of my work, the relative wage and time stability in the taxi industry are vestiges of achievements made by the taxi unions during the early half of the 20th century after massive strikes and violent protests. So what these changes in Uber driver grievances represents in the US and I suspect globally is a broader change around the temporality and remuneration associated with work. The average non-supervisory worker in the US today is earning, after controlling for inflation, a wage that is about 4% less than in 1972, 46 years ago. This is while average worker productivity, the amount of worker the worker produces in a day, has more than doubled since 1972. Today, Uber drivers make, on average, a wage that is about $10.70 an hour. And according to a number of empirical studies, that means that drivers make less than the minimum wage of major US cities, putting them in the lowest 20% of US earners. Okay, so now, um, how have these grievances been addressed? Since 2014, they've been addressed in three ways, through private lawsuits, through worker organizing, and through limited regulatory responses. And notably, none of these have been effective. <clears throat> and theoretically speaking, I argue that there have been two main structural forces impeding the collective action of drivers. The fragmentation of workers and labor groups, exacerbated by their putative independent contractor status, and the reliance on lawsuits to solve many of these grievances. So let's first look at the unique fragmentation of Uber drivers. Like taxi drivers, Uber drivers are dispersed and atomized. But unlike taxi drivers, they are dispersed not just across municipalities, but across much larger geographic regions. So San Francisco taxi drivers, for example, have city limits within which they can work. And these boundaries facilitate some form of repeated interaction among drivers who get to know each other. Also, unlike the number of taxi drivers, which is limited by the state, the number of Uber drivers is unlimited, making it much more difficult to dri for drivers to form interpersonal solidarities. Further, unlike taxi drivers who have a single municipal body to target for their advocacy, Uber drivers have any number of state entities who could potentially regulate them across municipal and state lines. And this contributes to framing problems for drivers. Who is their target? Is it the city, the state, Uber, or something more amorphous? Is it the algorithms? Finally, there is large worker turnover. By Uber's own accounting, only 4% of US drivers work for the company for more than a year. This large worker turn turnover is inspired not just by these grievances, but by Uber's own algorithms. After completing their first five to 10 ri rides, drivers complain that their rider requests drop. Uber, it turns out, is not facilitating market efficiencies by connecting the rider to the closest driver. Rather, the company funnels more rides to new drivers, 
or to lapsed drivers in an effort to lure them into the work. As one driver said, driving for Uber kind of feels like the Titanic. Each time it's getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, to highlight something that Julie Shore has usefully articulated in her work, Uber drivers are fragmented because they have fundamentally varying interests depending on their dependence on the platform. Full-time drivers may may want very different things in terms of regulation than part-time drivers do. In interviews, I found that many full-time drivers, for example, want employee status to give them wage protections, while many part-time drivers fear that employee status will impede their flexibility and their ability to work when they need to. And so my research suggests that there is a serious lack of consensus among drivers around this issue of employment status. And for various reasons, some structural and some ideological, roughly 60% of drivers surveyed want to be independent contractors, which puts them outside of the social safety net protections in the US associated with work. So fascinatingly, traditional trade unions, traditional unions and other labor organizations have also been divided in their approach to the issue of employment status. They either fight drivers' putative independent contractor status or accept it and try and achieve improvements within that status. So why is this surprising? Because in the US, only employee workers, not independent contractors, have the right to collectively bargain. Not only that, but if a labor union attempts to organize independent contractor workers, the union may be accused of illegal price fixing opening them up to financial losses associated with antitrust liabilities. So this is a huge impediment to the idea that unions would want to organize these workers. Nonetheless, unions have responded to Uber work. So consistent with the conventional strategy and organizing model of unions in the US, the national AFL-CIO has advocated for employment status, taking the position that Uber drivers are employees under the law because of the amount of control the company exerts over drivers, and that they, the union, must fight for the legal recognition that the protections and benefits um, employee status entails. And this position poses a direct challenge to Uber's business model. And the union, <clears throat> and for the union, it avoids the potential financial liabilities associated with organizing independent contractor workers. So union representatives from the AFL have uh, met with drivers, they've strategized around potential litigation and legislative proposals, they've filed court cases against Uber, and they've officially objected to court settlements that do not recognize employee status. Other unions have accepted the independent contractor status of Uber drivers, but have sought to mitigate its disadvantages. So the Teamsters in Seattle, for example, has fought for legislation to extend collective bargaining rights to all ride-hail drivers, and the SCIU has pushed for the extension of company-funded portable benefits to gig workers in two states. And these attempts to extend traditional employee benefits to independent contractor workers have mostly been pursued in legislative venues. Still other unions have likewise largely accepted the independent contractor status of drivers, but have foregone the traditional struggle, not only for employee status, but also for the right to collectively bargain and the relative job security associated with it. Instead, they seek to increase their membership by representing non-unionized members in discussions with Uber. Um, the International Association of Machinists, for example, has pursued direct negotiations with Uber in its effort to represent Uber drivers. Rather than advocating for legislation that would confer new rights for these workers, they've created a worker center, the Independent Drivers Guild, which struck a private agreement Uber agreed to establish grievance procedures for drivers and to discuss market-based portable benefits in exchange for the union's commitment not to strike and not to challenge the independent contractor status of Uber drivers. Um, the Teamsters in Northern California attempted something similar but failed. So in addition to unions, worker centers have also acted to um, represent drivers. A notable case is the Freelancers Union, which um, uh, sort of celebrates the independent contractor identity and the so-called freedom and flexibility of the work. Um, they have been an attractive partner for Uber and have actually um, been a paid consultant for the company. 
to try and create a plan around portable benefits that we have yet to see. Um, another labor group that is not an official union is the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, which was formed in 1998 to represent taxi workers. Um, their membership base has extended to include many full-time Uber drivers, and their primary form of advocacy has been around employee status. Um, and also, uh, more recently, in just the past two months, um, because of actually the suicide of taxi drivers in New York City, five suicides, um, they've gotten some traction in pushing for regulations around vehicle caps and around fare regulations. Um, hasn't been achieved yet, but probably the closest um, to anywhere in the, in the United States in terms of getting regulations we see because of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance's work in New York City. Um, so labor groups in the U.S. have taken these diverging approaches, and they've pursued these three different strategies, fighting for the legal classification of drivers em as employees, accepting their independent contractor status but fighting for collective bargaining rights, and accepting the independent contractor status but attempting to form worker associations. Um, so... In addition to sort of the fragmentation of Uber drivers and the limitation of unions to effectively represent them, um, I argue that driver collective action has been impeded by an over-reliance on private misclassification lawsuits, um, which have been filed against Uber in almost every single state in the U.S. by private plaintiff's attorneys. Because of the procedural problems associated with bringing a class action in the U.S., the ubiquitous presence of arbitration agreements, which the U.S. Supreme Court just found to be legal, um, which force drivers to have their cases heard outside of courts in private hearings, and the financial temptation for attorneys to settle before trial, collect collective workers' rights have not been successfully defended in the judicial arena in the U.S. Um, to date, there have been two important private enforcement lawsuits against Uber, both of which remain unsettled. Um, there's O'Connor v. Uber and the New York Taxi Workers Alliance versus Uber. So O'Connor um, uh, was the first sort of class action that was certified against Uber in 2013. Um, the court's decision to certify a large class, which could have impacted Uber's business model, was essentially overturned or eventually overturned um, by a U.S. Supreme Court decision. While this case is still very much alive, my guess is that it will have no impact um, because the class has been dispersed. The NYTWA has also filed uh, a class action, which is it's a wage and hour lawsuit, um, and it includes thousands of Uber drivers who have opted out of Uber's arbitration agreement, um, but the relatively small number of drivers relative th to the larger number of Uber drivers in the U.S. really, I think, limits the likely impact of that case as well. Um, the government itself, which is very well positioned to bring these cases, um, has not done so. There have been three cases um, brought by administrative agencies. One was just brought by the city of San Francisco because of a, um, a good California Supreme Court ruling that changed the definition of who is an employee for purposes of California wage and hour laws. Um, the city attorney in San Francisco just filed a lawsuit against Uber. The National Labor Relations Board three, two years ago filed a lawsuit um, or an investigation into whether or not Uber drivers were misclassified for collective bargaining um, purposes. We have yet to see any movement in that case. Um, and then fascinatingly, the Alaska, the state of Alaska's Workers' Compensation Board filed, um, fined Uber for violating local workers' compensation laws. They fined them only $71,000, but Uber's response was to leave the state. And so, two years later, to bring Uber back to the state, the Alaska legislature passed a bill exempting Uber from workers' compensation laws. And indeed, the most action that we have seen from the state with regard to driver grievances has looked exactly like this. Proactive state legislation to protect Uber, not to protect Uber driver, driver rights. So at least 25 U.S. states have passed laws stating that Uber drivers are independent contractors either presumptively or explicitly. 
Um, and regulatory hearings and rulemaking records reveal that this outcome is not only the result of intensive lobbying efforts, but also fears by city and state governments that if they do not give in to Uber's business model, they will drive away technological innovation and investments. So this is a depressing picture <laughs> of labor and collective act action on platforms in the US. And I don't mean to argue that a worker a workers' resistance movement is not afoot, or will that, that it would not, will not gain steam. But the fragmentation of workers, the division among labor groups on how to appropriately address workers' grievances, and the over-reliance on private lawsuits are significant barriers to the collective action of Uber drivers. Ultimately, Uber drivers who are attempting to collectively organize in the US are not just fighting for better working conditions, but in many ways, they are fighting a new moral world a world in which consumer convenience associated with new forms of time discipline and technology override long fought for labor protections that are completely appropriate, I want to argue, for the platform. To the extent that Uber workers can, will, and do mobilize, what they fight is not technology, but the exploitative and oppressive relationships intrinsic to digital capitalism. So what can regulators do to facilitate collective action and worker protections? So the answer is, sorry, the answer is multi-pronged. For various reasons that I can get into in the q and I don't think that in the US context, legal employment status for Uber drivers will be effective, even if by some miracle a court decision um, decides that Uber drivers are employees. Rather, I think reg regulators can pass laws ensuring that no worker, regardless of their status, contract, can contract for less than a minimum wage that all workers can organize, regardless of their employment status, without fearing um, allegations of price fixing, and that regulators can lift the significant legal and regulatory barriers to the formation of low-wage worker cooperatives, which is nearly impossible in the US right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting <coughs> presentation. Uh, I would suggest to the colleagues in the, in the audience to take note because we will also have a, a session of questions and answers. I see some friends of the uh, trade union movement here in Italy, so I'm sure that some questions will come. Uh, I think it was very interesting uh, what you said about the collective anxiety, which is somehow uh, falls within the broader discussion about technology, digitalization, automation, and, uh, and the future of work, but also of this uh, uh, sentiment of uh, self-regulation that uh, somehow, or in some cases, as you uh, very eloquently mentioned, uh, could affect uh, the fundamental principles and, uh, and rights of, uh, of workers. Um, with this, uh, I would pass to the second presenter, which is uh, Professor Valeria Pulignano of the University of Leuven, who will uh, talk about the government, governance of employment transitions and the social effects of the shared economy. If you can make it in 15 minutes, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the chair and thank you very much for the organizers of this conference. I'm very glad and honored also to be here and share some ideas about the shared economy with all of you. So, uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, I'd like to say that my presentation uh, is not based on empirical data. So we are collecting empirical data so at the very moment, in a specific, well, including the digital platforms, but also looking much more broadly about, you know, kind of uh, different areas of work, including creative work and, and so forth. Um, so I will just, um, uh, well, what I intend to do is to draw some considerations from a more kind of analytical and uh, uh, a theoretical, if you like, point of view, which might be relevant uh, also by welcoming the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, issue which was raised also by the chair, you know, needs to be kind of policy impact here. So let's try to see what can we do as researchers in that respect. 
Um, I would like to probably uh, start my presentation by linking to what uh, Stefano said at the very beginning, talking about this kind of equilibrium, which was uh, basically based around this kind of corporativism or corporativist system, which very much kind of, uh, uh, um, yeah, important uh, in Europe, particularly in Nordic, Nordic Western, uh, uh, Nordic European countries, continental European countries, but also with some examples also in southern uh, parts of the European uh, 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 globe, uh, which was in fact this equilibrium around, you know, trade unions, political parties, in terms of, you know, redistribution of uh, richness, uh, which is created through the taxation and welfare. Now, why do I say this? Because I think Stefano raised an important point uh, about the taxation. Uh, which in fact links to the social protection issues and which for me or to me means a lot in terms of understanding first of all what is work. Uh, so in order to create all this kind of infrastructure we need to be actually uh, uh, in agreement about work and what is work particularly in all this kind of change and in fact then I go starting to my presentation when I was uh, thinking and uh, reflecting upon what I'm going to present in Rome I thought well originally I thought I'm going to talk about the future of work but then I said mm, I don't like this I will talk about work and the future why because I think that not only around uh, digital platforms but also around you know, kind of uh, new technologies, uh, the debates, and when I talk about new technologies, I also reflect upon, you know, robotization, for example. We have a lot of examples of introduction of robotization in different firms at the very moment, particularly logistics is very interesting in that respect. We are doing some work on that. So we see uh, that, uh, you know, people start to, oh, from some parts, the debate goes in terms of saying, well, you know, there is probably some kind of effect on work, this kind of new technology they are going to have in terms of shrinking work. Uh, now, I think that the question here is not really uh, whether, um, you know, work will or will not be part of the future. I strongly think, and I hopefully, you know, share uh, your ideas as well on that, that work will be always part of the future. It's just really, I mean, the crucial question is how the change in, in fact, the employment relationship or what we used to consider from a traditional regulatory institutional point of view as being an employment relationship, how this kind of change in the employment relationship is actually going to impact upon the mechanism for value creation. Um, and therefore, the question is, where and how value is created related to work, which will probably will always have an important uh, role and will play an important role also in the kind of society of the futures, current societies and uh, so forth. Um, why do I say this? Because we know that work and employment relationship and the regulatory mechanisms and institutions more generally have and are undergoing profound uh, changes in capitalist society, uh, well, globalization or the openness of international market competition has increased, increased instability in the form of wage competition. We see this very much in Europe. And we see this because, in fact, we have actually faced a lot of transformations in those structures, particularly the industrial relations structures, uh, and there I want to say collective bargaining, uh, as an instrument for kind of, uh, in fact, redistributing richnesses uh, also across the population in needs and also extending to some other population which are, in fact, not still part of those. Um, so decentralization of collective bargaining, particularly uncoordination of this uh, decentralization. So what I'm going to... Is it here? Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to uh, say, um, well, I'm going to just uh, address the issue of work, which I think is very important, the change, talk about a bit the transitions in this kind of employment regulatory uh, system, and then look a bit at the effects on the shared economy and draw some conclusions. So first of all, work and what is changing about work. Now, we all know that work has a, and plays an important part. Uh, now I take my sociological kind of uh, head on my head. 
Uh, work is a core activity in society um, and is central uh, to individuals' identity. It links individuals to each other and it also locates uh, people uh, within what we use in sociological terms to define as stratification system. Uh, we also know that, and this is in fact what we have been doing and contributing and doing a lot, uh, we have been always referred to work uh, when we talk about this paid or wage related relationship. This is the kind of notion that we know when we talk in facts and we define what is an employment relationship. We look at paid work particularly. Now, um, what I also uh, think, and I will go back to this point a bit later, what I also think is that work as paid wage employment uh, also uh, is not only you know, a core central issue in individual life, but is also related to social order. I'm sure that many people will identify the kind of owners of uh, all these kind of little sentences which are indicated in there, uh, which come from classical sociology. People have been talking about how uh, social order uh, and work are related um, uh, in different uh, areas of our, the evolution of societies. Now, um, I want to say here, when I talk about social order, I'm not referring to stability. Uh, we all know that society is not an homogeneous entity, but is in fact uh, internally structured and uh, subdivided by processes of inclusion and exclusions. And we need to take these into consideration. Now, uh, from a kind of a theoretical uh, a point of view also, and particularly in the study of employment and industrial relations, um, we also know that this issue of the social order and social governance particularly has benefited from different theories, and I think there, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to go much more into details, but uh, we can actually see, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, theory of the production regimes, where the central argument is that uh, quite different employment dynamic by, can be found between different capitalist society, depending on the ways how firms solve their coordination problems related to industrial relations, vocational training, also uh, involvement on employees and so forth and so forth, but also, as Stefano mentioned, the power resource theory is very important because there we have, in fact, a more dynamic uh, kind of, I think, understanding about how these kind of uh, social order or social governance of employment um, is, uh, is happening. It depends, op, it depends very much on, uh, basically, the organizational power of collective actors, including employers and uh, trade unions and also mediated by the role of uh, the state. Now, what I think is that what we are experiencing in our days is a kind of change in this governance of the employment regimes. And the reason why I believe so uh, is because, again, you know, the notion we have of work in this kind of governance of the employment regimes that we know is very much, again, related to this idea of wage-paid employment, wage-paid labor and work. And in this kind of notion of wage-based employment relationship, which reminds us the classical idea of how collective actors operate and collectivism is created and solidarity and redistribution, in fact, is created, um, we see that nowadays, according to me, you see that you know, there has been a kind of shift uh, in what we are experiencing nowadays. But before I go to the shift, let me go and, and individuate what, I've, what, are, what have been the kind of crucial elements in the study of an employment relationship and the governance of the employment relations regime under this wage-based relationship. And those are exactly what is written on the slide, indeterminacy, which means that um, uh, unlikely virtually any other forms of uh, contracts is, um, which are evident in production, the labor contract, as we know, involves the exchange of money for actual goods or services, but the capacity to provide something desired by the purchaser. In other words, employers wishing to secure the fuel value of uh, the purchased labor power must ensure that workers sell an ability to work, which is translated into actual labor only during the course of the working day. Therefore, expectation about standard of the performance here, which is in fact needs to be given by the employees, 
uh, have to be built uh, during the process of production. And that's what we see. In other words, employers don't buy something certain, but they buy the capacity of the employees to serve them and to give them something you know, during uh, the process of uh, uh, production. This is what we use in employment relationship terminology to call indeterminacy. Asymmetry, I think, has been very much emphasized earlier on. This kind of uh, differentiation in power is an, an unbalanced power relation. The employment relationship is basically an unbalanced power relationship between employers and employees, between capital and labor. And the third one is the dynamism, which means that an employment relationship cannot be configured only as a conflict-based relationship, but is also a cooperative-based relationship. Actually, is a kind of combination of both. And is upon this that the, the kind of idea of the decommodification eh, of labor as through welfare in traditional kind of uh, um, employment system of governance has been built up during you know the last. Uh, the seniors that we have experienced. Now, I do think that what we are experiencing nowadays with, nowadays with the introduction of new technology, particularly digital platforms, is a shift from a wage-based relationship based on collectivism and redistribution to once more market-based relationship, very individualistic, atomized workers, as uh, uh, Vena was mentioning before, talking about the Uber uh, workers. And here what we see, we see a kind of, in fact, change of the paradigm. We don't have indeterminacy. Actually, indeterminacy is very difficult to be found out. Why? Because dependent or solo or bogus, whatever you want to call them, uh, for me, are workers anyhow, uh, dependent self-employed classification, mobilize commitment to quality work and encourages self-discipline. They have been neutralizing the indeterminacy of labor, which was in fact at the basis of what we know being an employment relationship or wage-based relationship. Secondly, um, I think what also we see here is uh, a kind of, if you like, challenge to the idea of the asymmetry and uh, the imbalances of power of the employment relationship. Um, simply because what we see nowadays is that this kind of the in digital platforms, labor uh, is undermined. I mean, professional identities, let's put it in this way, are undermined. And there is a sort of engineering cultures in dependency of location and ownership, which in fact, if you like, uh, challenges the principle of the asymmetry eh, between capital and labor as we used to know it. And second, and thirdly, the dynamism. We also don't see that anymore. It's difficult to identify because uh, we see a kind of weaknesses uh, or weakening of the reciprocity in the employment contract. Um, now, we know that direct reciprocity and trust in the relationship, in the employment relationship, traditionally speaking, uh, between management and employees used to be, in fact, very important. And this was one of the most important bases for creating and claiming about cooperation, claiming about the fact that there is a commitment, there is an engagement. Here I use more a kind of uh, mm, uh, a jargon from a human resource management perspective. Eh? People need to be committed to engage in their own relationship. Now, from, economic, from an economic point of view, uh, we also know that reciprocity is an important uh, um, uh, kind of enforcement device in the presence of incomplete labor uh, contract. Now, we see these actually not anymore there. Why? Because freelancers and uh, subcontracted employees working on these sort of digital platforms or whatsoever are deemed to develop uh, a sort of profit mindset. We are the entrepreneur, and we are, in fact, the responsible of what uh, we do. So in this kind of idea, we can actually uh, build upon the idea of the recommodification. So labor becoming a sort, in fact, through of, uh, uh, um, commodity, uh, through work, uh, work fair, which is, in fact, uh, the fact that people need to work uh, in order to receive their own aid. Uh, and that's uh, what where we are. Now, I don't know, probably I won't have so much time, so I will go very much um, uh, uh, quickly here. Here I tried to systematize, anyhow, you will have the slides, try to systematize some sort of sh uh, shifting in this employment system or regimes, if you like, 
from Fordism to post-Fordism to digital economy. What I want to like to point attention here is on the fact that the organizational model of these digital uh, and shared economy is the lattice organization. Now, I'm not an organizational specialist, so I've been you know, kind of un trying to understand what is a lattice organization. And I actually found that definition of this lattice organization, which says a lot to me in terms of this kind of profit mindset idea, which is in fact a kind of underpinning the kind of, again, you know, market-based uh, employment relationship typical of digital platform. And you have the definition here, which says, which comes from Bill Gore, who is the creator of this uh, terminology, says a lattice organization is one that involves direct transactions self-commitment, natural leadership, and lacks assigned or assumed authority. It is through these lattice organizations that things get done, and most of us delight in going around the formal procedures and doing things the straightforward way uh, and easy. Eh, most easy, eh, as easy as, uh, much as easy as possible. So that's where we are, and um, uh, yeah, here probably I can also skip that, it's not really so relevant, but what I want to probably go into are the effects uh, on the shared economy. Now, if we start from these uh, kind of, uh, if you agree about the shift in the uh, kind of conceptualization of an employment relationship, we probably also might want to discuss about uh, uh, what is shared economy. Now, unfortunately, I was not yesterday here in the morning, but this concept I'm sure has been discussed very much, but it was in the afternoon. Now, it seems to me that in fact we still lack, despite the fact we are doing a lot of movement in that direction, but we still lack a clear definition of shared economy. If we might eh, even go to that direction, we might find a, a definition. I'm quite not co uh, uh, convinced about the possibility to find a common definition here. So. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, we have some commonalities in the different definitions we have. And these commonalities, I think I try to um, indicate in here. Um, well, first of all, the fact that in all these sharing, uh, this sharing is to monetize human efforts and consumers' uh, assets. Uh, we also see that the advantage of a platform-based companies often rests on the arbitrage between the practices adopted by platform firms and the rules by which established companies operate, which are intended to protect customers, communities, workers, and markets. And thirdly, and here I uh, actually claim back uh, a kind of definition from Sisman and Newman, this idea of the putting out economy, which has been very much, you know, discussed in uh, 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 kind of looking uh, at the uh, 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 digital or shared economy or gig economy whatsoever, um, which in fact uh, uh, resembles this idea a bit of the peace rate system under which people on digital um, platforms are operating. Uh, we also see the discussions uh, about the sharing economy, uh, again, as I said, lacks clear definition because in fact, uh, you see that in the public debate, uh, there are people that actually uh, use slogans like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that these digital platforms are in fact bringing innovation and probably that's what it is. Other opponents, they say, well, this is, isn't really a uh, kind of innovation. It's not even uh, capitalism. This is worse than capitalism. So there is a lot of discussion about that. But nevertheless, if we look, and now I go a bit behind the labor platform idea eh, that has been also discussed yesterday, if it really go a bit broader, what we could identify here again as something you know, common are two things. The fact that sharing might, in fact, um, recall eh, some sort of uh, understanding about the fact that customer and market are becoming closer to each other. Uh, in the sense the sharing is about consumer-to-consumer -consumer platforms. That's also what, you know, uh, is in the uh, kind of public debate. Uh, it's not about renting or leasing a good uh, from a company, business to customer, but something uh, 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 more. It's also about consumers providing each other temporary access to a good and not about the transfers of ownership or good. Um, but nevertheless, if we actually now uh, 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 move on on that, 
Um, probably what also we could say is that there is something also even more common, uh, which is in fact this reorganization of a wide variety of markets, work arrangements, uh, and um, value creation and capture. Uh, and here I want to recall uh, the definition which comes from uh, Ekbia and Nardi on this uh, kind of uh, heteromation, uh, where it says that, um, you know, again, uh, we used to, to think in terms of relationship between human intervention and technology, and uh, now we have something a bit different. <coughs> Uh, where uh, heteromation it pushes critical tasks to humans as indispensable mediators. Um, so, which in fact do these sometimes across the borders of their own private and public life, work, and probably what we unconventionally used to consider as no work, but we probably need to reconsider as work. Now I escape all because I don't have probably the time to go across all these. Uh, yeah, uh, but oh no, wait. Probably one thing before. Um, yeah, here. No, I will. I will go. Yeah, I will not go into the. Yeah, I think it's too much. Um, well, let me go to the conclusion. Uh, so, in terms of policy relevance, I do think I do believe that in the light of I hope. Um, this kind of shifting in the understanding of the employment relationship. We need to really, first of all, kind of understand, in fact, where this value creation happens, where this value is captured. And I have the uh, kind of impression that, in fact, this means that we need to re-ask to ourselves, ourselves, what is work on this digital platform across the borders of private and, pri private and public, and probably there kind of... Uh, think about possible, possible re-regulatory uh, framework uh, to, in fact, be able to create new rules around this new understanding of employment relationship, which can, in, in fact, be effective to protect workers. Uh, but also, and I, I didn't have the time to dig into that, although it's one of my, in I think, uh, interesting, or more, in more uh, uh, important aspect I would have raised, but I didn't have the time. Uh, we need to create and recreate probably spaces for representation uh, and particip participation and voice. And there, you know, I think that the presentation before me raised uh, important issues we might want to reflect upon on how to, in fact, kind of include these workers in new collective framework for representation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pulignano. I think that... Uh, I particularly appreciated the, how to say, the sociological dimensions of, uh, of uh, your presentation. And I, I think that one of the, the points that I, I, I took is uh, basically uh, discussing what is the meaning of work nowadays. And maybe most, most importantly, or more importantly, the role that work plays uh, in the realization of uh, individuals and their families, uh, if this is still central to a person's life or if it has become an ancillary. But also what is interesting and I think a bit linked to the previous presentation is this issue of, uh, um, you know, misclassification, this issue of, uh, you know, disguising perhaps uh, uh, new forms of work uh, that disguise uh, uh, forms of work that we have uh, known for quite some time, like independent work uh, or like, uh, uh, you know, what was mentioned yesterday about triangular relationships uh, uh, where somehow, you know, the classical employment relationship is, uh, is disguised. Um, thank you also for the takeaways, and uh, with this, I will give the floor, and I'm now giving the floor to Professor Faioli, uh, who is uh, a professor of labor law at uh, the University of Rome, Roma 3, and, uh, uh, sorry, Tor Vergata, scusa Michele. 
let's say to, no, bec that's true wrong. because like no no it's because Michele is a professor in different universities he's also a professor to the, in the Catholic University of Rome right so that's why I got confused <laughs> and uh, Professor Faioli will talk about um, uh, one of the issues that has been highly debated in many countries, uh, including in Italy, about uh, Industry 4.0 and uh, uh, the, the role of the gig economy. He's a very, how to say, knowledgeable uh, uh, researcher and uh, about the Italian labor market, about labor law and labor legislation in Italy. So I'm sure that uh, we will get very interesting insights from his presentation. Michele, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the floor. And uh, I would like to thank Stefano Sacchi and uh, um, Dario Guarascio for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, happy also to see many familiar faces with whom uh, I had the chance and the opportunity to work uh, in these uh, more or less three, four years of research concerning uh, whatever is cons related to digital revolution and work. Um, the time is limited, so I'm going just to start. I will try to be in more or less 10 minutes and my uh, introduction will be divided in two sections. Uh, I would pursue um, in this short presentation, in this short introduction, uh, uh, what I think is a potential clue for our understanding of the connection between what I call artificial intelligence or new employer, uh, labor relations, uh, workplace process, and what these uh, kind of connection is uh, requesting today and the next future to the labor regulations. Um, I'm not searching for a full blown uh, of such connection. I'm rather trying uh, to looking for some insights in labor regulation in Europe uh, and uh, uh, in US as well. Um, because I'm, I'm really eager to understand how regulatory attitude may conduce uh, to what I call full justice by means of, co of collective bargaining and administrative uh, uh, process. So let's focus on my uh, research and my slide and I will try to stay in these 10 minutes and to divide my, my introduction in these um, two sections. Uh, my research are based on uh, uh, more or less four years of research that are going to be, um, um, to be um, collected in my forthcoming book uh, concerning uh, artificial intelligence, labor uh, relations, and uh, um, whatever is related to this digital revolution. I had the chance to create with the Italian unions, German unions and French unions, a data set of 300, more or less 300 firm level collective bargaining. These firm level collective bargaining were aimed at uh, understanding uh, the reaction of workplace uh, process uh, to the digit revolution and to understand if uh, the collective bargaining were able to anticipate in some way to positively react to this uh, revolution. Um, I tried also to focus on uh, uh, SME other than multinational. In addition, uh, we had the chance to interview 28 uh, gig economy platform operating in Italy. And with my team uh, of Fondazione Brodolini and the University of Rome, we had also the chance to enter in this platform. We enroll as worker and uh, with my students, and uh, we had, uh, you know, you. also me. <laughs> my platform was Pet Me. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Although I don't like very much, you know, pet, but it was, you know, was a good exercise. Well, not for them. Not, not for, for them. 
was a good exercise. However, you know, 300 firm level bargaining to understand what is 4.0 and tech. And the other side, 28 platform operating in Italy. I believe that is a good cluster to understand what is going in the reality. Um, just a general definition of, of what we consider artificial intelligence basing on uh, the uh, soft law that at European law, uh, law are going to be developed. What wh why we are focusing on artificial intelligence? Because the starting point of our research is uh, related to the main question, who is the employer, not what kind of protection we should provide to the employee. Because we consider that if we are able to answer to the, this question, who is the employer, in 4.0 and gig employer will be easier to understand what kind of protection we can provide uh, to the workers in gig economy or whatever is related to 4.0. Uh, the definition of artificial intelligence is, is well known. You, you find here the main four features, you know, is autonomous, self-learning, uh, can have physical support and what is more very important to me as a labor law scholar is self-aware, is able to decide, to manage, to control, to indicate. That is very important. Um, so the first section, in my view, in my research, I try to collect, to connect 4.0 revolution to gig economy. I believe that they are part of the same phenomenon, the same phenomenon. We know the differences. We know that uh, 4.0 revolution is related to manufacturing, internal flexibility. There is a, you know, a huge EU or national state program of debt tax in order to promote 4.0. On the other side, we have a gig economy that is uh, related to service delivery, uh, it concerns uh, external flexibility, I, it is not promoted or boosted by the tax policies. But we believe that they are part of the same phenomenon. Why? Because we believe that artificial intelligence, that is the new employer, is, uh, at, uh, the, is the key concept, the key uh, value of this connection. If you look, uh, uh, if you give a look to the, uh, the value chain, the new value chain related to the new kind of 4.0 and gig economy, you find whatever that is a, a digital tool, mechanical tool that is aimed at creating this uh, connection between 4.0 and gig economy. Let's see also these. Um, this slide where you, sorry, where you find, uh, where you find, you know, the smart factory producting by means of digital tools, providing uh, uh, a certain kind of delivery. And we also observe that they need more delivery. And this delivery is based on uh, on-demand delivery because there is a strong relation, direct, direct relation with the consumer everyone to everyone economies call it because the consumer is deciding what kind of product and what kind of service delivery should be done, should be carried out. So this link that is a, a reality, is a link uh, that is based on the reality, is also shaping the workplace process, is also shaping the workplace process regulation. Um, so let's focus on some labor uh, aspects. In our view, viewpoint, uh, whatever is related to the four uh, uh, industrial relations, the fourth in industrial relation 4.0, is related to what we call internal flexibility. And to us, internal flexibility is uh, 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 mainly regimes uh, uh, linked to working hours, salaries, classification of personnel. And we had the chance to see in our uh, investigations 
that the French, the German, the Italian smart factory, or whatever we want to say concerning 4.0 factories, are implementing tech and digit tools that are pushing on this internal flexibility. So we have a strong SAP process, SAP. SAP process means that you have a software process, artificial intelligence, managing whatever is related to the production, the delivery, the marketing, and so on, and at the same time is also able to manage the personnel and the human capital uh, related to this process. In our investigation, we also noted that the firm level bargaining uh, was called to react to this kind of new process. And in Germany, above all in Germany, we understood that this internal flexibility by means of Betriebestrat uh, uh, was implemented, uh, creating a sort of good flexibility because there was the chance to intervene on classification, working hours and salary in relation to what the new process were creating at the firm level. In Italy, we still do not have a full data set of the Jobs Act reform because most of you know that in 2004, 15, by means of Jobs Act, we changed our section of, of the Italian Civil Code concerning the classification uh, regime. And that, uh, uh, that section was reformed maybe in light of the possible change that also this kind of revolution is bringing at a firm level. We have now the chance to operate by means of a firm level collective bargaining in order to remove obstacles to the classification and to the job rotation and whatever is linked to the capacity to uh, adapt the uh, human resource uh, capability to the tech cap capability. Uh, gig economy on the other side, uh, although we consider that are part of the same uh, process, uh, in my view can be divided with method and order in four uh, portion. I do not consider for my study whatever is re related to Uber, because Uber, uh, at least in Europe, uh, is under the regime, a special regime related to taxi driver at a national level, European level. We have a, a legal clash between competition law uh, labor protection and other aspects that are managed by regulation. I don't consider in my research whatever is linked to Task Rabbit, Vicker, or something like Pronto Pro. Uh, you know, this kind of platform, they are something like yellow pages. I mean, there is a matchmaking between self employed and families looking for some kind of services. I don't consider Amazon Mechanical Turk, Turk because to me, in my view, is something that we cannot study because it is totally related to have a Chinese translation and you have a worker in India, in China, in Japan working for you and pay without, you know, jurisdiction uh, number 81. And this section two uh, is a, a labor regime extending the protection of employees to self-employed, bocus self-employed independent contractors. Unfortunately, this idea is not shared by most of the Italian labor scholars. And unfortunately, also the uh, labor judge of Turin uh, some weeks ago, with 10 lines in his case law, wrote, ruled that section two cannot be applied to uh, Fudora riders. In my view, this is a big mistake. I hope that the Court of Appeal can change and overrule this, uh, this uh, uh, sentence. And uh, I don't share this idea because uh, 
to me there was a sort of misinterpretation of the words even, anche, is a word that is contained uh, uh, in this section too, and uh, this section uh, is um, uh, strictly, strictly focused on uh, what we had in the past in Italy, because for more than 20 years we struggled with the bogus self-employed, the lavora progetto and so on. So the, 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 the law, uh, the, um, the rulers, I mean, was able to understand what uh, we had in our hands and decided in, two fi uh, in 2015 to change and to had uh, an option to extend the protection of employees to workers. In addition, and this is an idea that we are developing at CNEL, I'm sure that Professor Treo is calling President Sack President Saki also for this reason, we are elaborating a proposal of law in order to, to uh, consider some of these workers better, to consider some of these uh, gig economy platforms as temporary worker agency. In our view, there is enough room to move to promote the idea that Fudora, Deliveroo are operating as temporary worker agency. And this means as an effect, as a consequence, that if you oblige Fudora to enroll in the uh, public list uh, that Ampal uh, um, take, takes care, you have as a consequence the protection of the workers, the riders, for salary, for social security, for whatever is related to the basic protection as employee but as a temporary workers, because you had at the uh, as a you know, as a cascade, you had at the first step the uh, mandatory uh, definition of a platform as a, a temporary agency worker agency. So we are working on that, and we are open to the uh, to the idea that there is enough room, and also exchange ideas with uh, whom uh, uh, wants to you know to uh, 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 buttress our yes our um, our idea uh, finally uh, what I see as uh, this is the second section and also the conclusion what I see as a possible um, uh, for coming uh, uh, because we are in uh, uh, I mean in up organized this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, workshop and so I mean there is an occasion to propose something that can be in some way um, promoted uh, uh, for the government, the parliament. What we consider as the keystone for the next months, I have already mentioned the idea to uh, develop Section 2 and to uh, buttress Section 2 of Jobs Act. I also mentioned the idea of a temporary workers' agency. The last point, I'm strongly, I'm strongly convinced that the future of the connection between the gig economy and 4.0 revolution is in the hands of the social partners, at least in Europe and in Italy. I'm, consider I'm considering the idea that the future of the protection can be better implemented by means of two uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, light reforms concerning our industrial relations system. The first, I believe that uh, we should have a workplace representation that is no longer linked or defined by the perimeter, the walls, of the firms. I believe that our RSA or RSU should be extended to the value chain. That means production, means marketing, means selling, but also delivery. And as a consequence, you will have a workplace representation, RSU, RSA, that is able to negotiate firm level bargaining also for the workers 
that are uh, uh, employed for uh, uh, rides and uh, whatever is delivery. Also the little riders, uh, the small riders of Deliveroo and Fudora, because they are part of the process. Second, that is much more important in my view, we should have a law that fix the, uh, the uh, personal scope of the firm level collective bargaining in order to avoid that any kind of personal or minority challenge can uh, uh, um, reduce the effect of the firm level collective bargaining. We have now uh, this, uh, uh, this effect that is based on uh, um, unions, agreements, proto uh, protocoli, but we need a law that buttress this effect. Otherwise, uh, the protection that we are uh, um, asking for the gig workers will be totally ineffective. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Faioli. So, I mean, just a few things uh, very briefly. The, uh, Professor Faioli referred to CNEL, which is basically the nation, National Tripartite Economic and Social Council, uh, where it's been discussed this, uh, this, uh, this draft law. And the AMPAL is the National Employment Agency. It was mentioned with reference to the fact that uh, providers have to be registered in uh, in, uh, in this agency. Um, I think we'll, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I was smiling uh, when you said that uh, you register yourself as a platform worker because I did the same uh, a few years ago as a young job seeker because I was working on a program of uh, advisory services to a country and then I wanted to see whether the online registration was working, I mean it was working, so after 12 hours I got an email from the counselor and then for 10 days I, I, I kept on getting uh, uh, you know, recallers for an interview until uh, I had to really unveil my real age and also my nationality. But it's, uh, it's interesting also, I mean, to, you know, to go through and to try and test these mechanisms. Uh, we will have, uh, because otherwise we, you will collapse, so I think it's uh, more than due a break, a coffee break of uh, 10 minutes, uh, and then we resume the discussion with uh, other panelists. Thank you. Okay, we are about to start. I don't know if there is anybody in the hall. If so, if you could please tell them to come in. Okay, so we'll start with the second part of the panel. 
uh, we will uh, go through three presentations. This is a kind of uh, family to me uh, because uh, I'm uh, uh, quite close to two of the panelists and I look forward to become, to get closer also to the third panelist. As well, I have two of uh, my ILO colleagues, uh, Janine Berg, uh, who is a senior economist uh, in uh, uh, the ILO in the Conditions of Work and Employment Department. Uh, Mr. or Professor uh, Valerio De Stefano, who is a professor of labor law at the Leuven University, but formerly and up to a few months ago with uh, uh, working with Janine uh, in uh, the ILO. And then we have uh, uh, Lorenzo Cini from the uh, Scuola Normale Superiore of Florence, which is a research uh, uh, institute uh, based uh, uh, in uh, Florence. So, we'll start first with uh, Janine, uh, university. Yeah. Is that university, right? Okay, okay. Ah, Pisa and Florence. All right, okay, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I've so been... It's, it's in Pisa and the class of political sciences is okay. in Florence. I, my, my apologies, I was uh, away of Italy for half of my life. Uh, so I'm still getting adjusted uh, to the, 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 my current reality and my current job. So Janine will uh, uh, present, uh, her presentation will focus on the regulation of crowd work and uh, she will uh, uh, highlight both uh, challenges and uh, opportunities. Janine, you have the floor. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. Thank you also to the IEO for all the organization. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here and to discuss this issue. So uh, as Gianni mentioned, I'm an economist, um, but I work at the ILO, and so I'm always conscious about the regulatory debates around these issues. So what I'm going to present today is research that we've been doing, really started in, in 2015. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a few highlights of some of the studies we've done and some of the regulatory questions that we're grappling with. So I, unfortunately, I couldn't be here yesterday. I imagine in the beginning there was some discussion about the differences in, in platforms. Uh, this is just a diagram to, to show you. I mean, really, within the digital labor platforms, you have those that are, that are local, the, the deliveries, the Ubers, and of course those that are geographically dispersed across the world. And within those, you have what we call macro tasks, which are kind of a higher end, maybe longer term jobs of web programming, for example, or logo design. And then what we do, what we call micro tasks, which are the short uh, clerical type jobs that are usually paid by the piece. There's no bargaining. A job is posted, it pays uh, 10 cents, somebody does it, submits it um, you know, 30 seconds later, and, and then they're paid either by PayPal or through their bank account. So most of our research has actually focused on the international geographically dispersed uh, platforms, though we've done some research on the local ones. But for us, the regulatory questions of the international issues, just like uh, Michel uh, mentioned in his past presentation, are, are much actually much more difficult to, to deal with. So uh, in that respect, it's, it's more difficult, but also more interesting. OK, so despite these differences in platforms, there are some main uh, uh, characteristics in common. And, and one of them is, is the, the nature that this is really just casual work. So we, we refer to this as casual work 4.0. And I think this quote actually really sums up the casual nature of the work. It was a, something that was said by Lucas Bewald. He's the founder of one of the leading crowd, uh, crowd working platforms, Crowdflower, now been renamed figure eight. But as he described it, before the internet, it would be really difficult to find someone, sit them down for 10 minutes and get them to work for you, and then fire them after those 10 minutes. Now you can actually find them, pay them the tiny amount of money, and then get rid of them when you don't need them anymore. So I think this sums up really well uh, what is the nature of a lot of this work. Another overarching feature, and this is true to the local-based uh, apps, is also to the, to the web-based platforms, is the, is the algorithmic management. And this really affects workers because if there's a problem with their payment, um, if there's a problem, if there's unclear instructions about the job that they're doing, they have nobody to talk to. So Lily Arani, who's one of the leading researchers in this topic, uh, she communicated with one of the 
users, one of the clients uh, of these crowd working platforms. And this is what he, he said to her, you cannot spend time exchanging email with the workers. The time you spent looking at the email costs more than what you paid them. This has to function on autopilot as an algorithmic system and, and integrated with your business process. So from a business point of view, you can understand he's right. They're not being paid very much. You don't have time to, to talk to the worker. But from a worker perspective, this is highly problematic. Okay, so for us, um, we started looking at this issue, as I said, in 2015. Initially, we ran surveys. We actually posted them as a job on two English-speaking platforms, Amazon Mechanical Turk and Crowdflower. And then in 2017, we re-ran the same survey, but we extended it to three additional platforms, um, Microworker, Clickworker, and Prolific Academics. So now in total, we have five platforms and 3,500 workers. I'm not gonna go into detail of all the study. It's actually quite a comprehensive study. We'll be releasing it on July 25th, uh, but we surveyed 3,500 workers from 75 countries. Overall, there's four main areas of concern of the workers. One is the pay of the tasks. And this is something that came out amongst all the workers, even from workers in developing countries where even the pay is relatively better for these workers. Another real issue is the availability of work. So people do like the flexibility, but on this, at the same time, they might have a, a, a space of time where they're ready to work and they sit down and there aren't jobs available. They also spend a lot of time looking for work. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of people on the platforms and the jobs go, go very quickly. Uh, so in fact, in our findings, we find that for every hour of spent working, 20 minutes of that hour is spent on unpaid working time. So either looking for jobs or doing a series of unpaid qualification tests. Because you have so many different clients posting work and they don't know who these people are, to ensure some sort of quality, they'll actually post uh, jobs that then you have to do and you have to qualify for. And, and it's, depending on the platform, you have to earn certain badges and certain status levels. Uh, and to earn these badges and status level, levels, you spend a lot of time doing unpaid work. The other issue is the unfair treatment by requesters, uh, and this get back, gets back to the, the issue of algorithmic management. In some instances, um, the way that the systems are, are set up, they'll, they'll have a job that's the same task. They give it to three people. If two people do it one way and one person does it another way, they pay the, the, the two people who did it the certain way. So this is automatically the, the algorithm pays it that way, even if the case where the person who did, the one person who did it a certain way was correct. And then there's no one to talk to if you're not getting paid. So basically they keep the work and they don't pay. And then the other real complaint was the lack of responsiveness of the platforms themselves to the workers' concerns. Okay, so here's just a little bit of data for you on the earnings of the survey response, of respondents. This is coming out of the 2017 survey. Uh, it's kind of hard to read all the data, but just to summarize really quickly, um, People basically, on average, they earn between two dollars and seven seven dollars an hour. That's the median. Uh, that's the mean. Av the average wage. Of course, this is highly skewed, and so most people are earning much less. Um, the, w the ones who work the most are the American workers on the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform. We have a kind of a special um, analysis of them. That's the bar on the right. So they're the ones who are earning up to seven dollars an hour. Uh, but we actually think that this over. Uh, th these rates are actually higher than what they in fact are. Uh, there was a study that came out recently by Hera et al. where they designed a plugin uh, for the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform, and 2,500 workers downloaded, the, downloaded this plugin and it tracked their work during a period of two years. Uh, so, this was a really kind of a, a really good study, and there they found a median wage of $2 and a mean wage of $3.13 an hour. Um, we also found from our own, our own study that two-thirds of the American workers were earning less than the federal minimum wage. And in addition, in click worker, the average wage was $3.31 an hour, uh, the median wage of $2.13 an hour. However, the platform advertises that you can earn on average $9 an hour, which is about the equivalent of the German minimum wage. Uh, many of the workers are really in a situation of financial precarity. Uh, they also don't really have access to, to social security s systems, or they're not contributing to the secure social security systems. If they are, it's because they're doing it through their other job. So for the American workers, for example, 40% uh, of them did this as their main source of income. Of those 40% that did it as their main source of income, 91% were not contributing voluntarily to the social security system. Uh, for the sample as a whole, we found that about 16% of the workers 
for whom crowd work is their main source of income are covered by Social Security. Uh, but with, for those who it's not their main source of income, 44% are being covered by Social Security. But this is really, you know, it's through another job, it's through their, uh, it's through their spouse, or it's because the country has some sort of Social Security system that is, that is universal and citizen-based. Um, we Here's just some data on financial precarity. Um, so the orange bar is house, households do not have enough savings to cover an emergency. The blue bar is households' monthly income is not enough to cover basic needs. Uh, so we see that in Africa that's 42%, but in Europe that's uh, 17%, in America that's 17%. Now, what's surprising about this is that actually the education level of the workers is actually quite high. Uh, so in the United States, over 50% have a college degree. In, in India, where there's a large pool of Indian workers on these platforms, 85% have a postgraduate degree. Uh, these are people who already have some sort of, uh, you know, these are not the poorest of the poor because they have to have internet access, they have to have computers, they need to speak English, and they need to be digitally literate. So it's already an upper, uh, an upper um, level, but yet they are in a situation of financial precarity. We have a study that we also did on Ukraine that will be released in a few weeks. Um, that's the way it looks right, right there. Uh, this was a study that it was inspired because at the time I had a colleague who's Ukrainian and she would go back to Ukraine and a lot of her friends had quit their day jobs. So we decided to do a study of Ukrainian uh, platform workers. Also because uh, they have a high level of education and there's a very strong IT um, IT education is very strong in the country, and so they're actually one of the leading international providers of IT work. So we undertook a study that had a quantitative component where we ran a thousand, uh, a thousand surveys. We had a thousand respondents to our surveys, but we also did qualitative surveys with focus groups, six focus groups with 49 respondents and 11 in-depth interviews. Uh, just to give you some of the highlights of the study, uh, we, we were able to identify 40 labor platforms that people work on, either English speaking, uh, Russian speaking, so within the whole Russian speaking uh, area or local. It was the main source of income for one out of four workers. Uh, Two-thirds of the workers primarily worked on one platform, and this has to do a lot with the whole, um, the difficulty in, in working over multiple platforms, also especially if you have to establish ratings and reputations, and there is definitely a startup cost to workers between switching platforms. The reasons for doing the work, uh, for some people, was certainly to earn extra income. Uh, for some, it was because they wanted to work from home. There was better pay compared to the local market, given the economic and, and uh, political situation in, in Ukraine. There was a lack of local opportunity, so this was a source of work for them. Uh, it also meant that some of these workers didn't have to migrate. The most popular type of work was copywriting for websites, uh, and then the set with 23% of workers doing that, and IT, 12% uh, of workers doing IT work. 80% of the workers were paid by the project, but we found that 12% were paid hourly and 8% were actually salary-like transfers. So we actually discovered that there's a situation where we called closed platforms where people start working on a platform and then they're invited to work on a closed platform or they're invited to be basically in an employment relationship uh, with, with, with the client that, that initially posted the work and they're actually getting monthly salary-like transfers. We found that one third of the workers had experienced a non-payment of their work. So the whole problem here with, with wage theft and non-payment is, is a big one. And again, this issue of who to turn to if you don't get paid. Um, we also found that 85% of the workers uh, pay a commission to the platform to do their work. So many of the freelancing platforms, uh, for example, Upwork, but the other ones as well, they don't charge the client, they charge the worker. So this actually goes against ILO conventions on fee charging agencies. Um, and, and you can understand from a business perspective why they do this. So, you know, that way it, it, it attracts people to, it attracts the clients who they need to use the work, uh, and then they, and then they, but then they charge the worker. And 27% of the workers provide screenshots of the work that they do or have been asked to install software that monitors their work. So again, this whole issue of control uh, of the workers on the platform. Uh, and here we found that three quarters are not registered as self-employed with the authorities and are not paying social security contributions. So a very much uh, informal work in the country. Okay, so the current situation is one where really it's not an unregulated uh, labor market. It's a platform regulated labor market. Uh, the platform decides how often and in what context participants are exposed to each other, what information is collected by the parties, how this information is displayed. Platforms set the policies on what trades are permissible, how entry is gained, and what contracts and prices are allowed, and so on. This is a quote from a study that came out in 2013 
on digitalization and the contract labor market, also written by somebody who had originally worked for Upwork. So, I mean, it's, it really describes very clearly how much control the platforms exercise, how you have to agree to uh, everything to the terms of service, and then, of course, if there's a dispute, it's usually something that is resolved by the platform and usually in the favor of the client and not of the worker. So when you see this, you have to ask yourself, why should we be leaving regulation to Jeff Bezos? I mean, this is, this is actually quite problematic. Um, but of course, there is a big challenge in regulating international crowd work. Now, uh, despite that challenge, one of, the, one of the advantages I see is that technology can really be part of the solution. So if you compare this to home-based work, traditionally, it's very difficult to monitor working conditions. But now, because of technology that can manage your, you know, that can see how many keystrokes you're doing and take random screenshots and can track your work through GPS for the Uber drivers, uh, and that can, and knows your entire work history, that this is something that regulators could use if they were to decide that they wanted to monitor. Uh, another idea, and this is one that's put forth by uh, Sanjeev Paul Shudari, who we recently uh, issued a working paper by him, is you know, what about having some sort of, if workers could have the right to access all of their data, then they could give that data to a third party. So maybe you could foresee some sort of, in the future, some sort of trade union which would get, you know, they could turn over their data to some sort of trade union, and trade union could use collective bargaining. I realize we're a long way away from that, but I think there, it is important to think about how technology can help and, and can facilitate the monitoring of working time, the monitoring of the payment of wages, and of course, the payment of Social Security benefits. But of course, it's very hard to do this uh, because the current situation is that you will have the, the platform in California, you might have the, cli the client in Europe, and then you have workers you know, maybe in Brazil, in Lagos, or in India. So at what level are you going to set uh, the minimum wage? Uh, what is the jurisdiction that, that, that should be regulating this? And this is you know, a very difficult question. It's one that Michel mentioned in his, his presentation. But I think maybe... Um, we could, I mean, we, mean, we need to be thinking about it at a different level. So at the ILO, we have the Maritime Labor Convention, that uh, fr framework that was passed in 2006 that regulates seafarers, and of course they're regulated internationally because of the industry. You have uh, seafarers from all over the world. You have ships that are registered in whatever country is easier for the ship owners to register their country, and of course they circulate all over the world. Uh, but you have an international regulation that, that, does, that does regulate them. So could we be thinking in the future of some sort of uh, Maritime Labor Convention for crowd workers. So a lot to be done, uh, but what I just want to end with is a quote from one of the workers who filled out our surveys. This was a worker on Amazon Mechanical Turk saying, this is obviously a way of working that will likely explode in the future. If some sort of fairness were present in early stages, it would prove beneficial to long-term prospects. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Uh, for the very interesting presentation, also for sharing with us the, the findings of this uh, survey and the research you are doing that will be published, I understand, uh, soon, uh, the, bo both working paper and on Ukraine and then the, yeah. the results of the survey next month. Thank you. Uh, now we move to Professor De Stefano, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise he will hit me. <laughs> <laughs> non è vero. Um, he will, Valerio will uh, talk about uh, focus particularly on the employment relationship, but also will uh, discuss access to social protection by workers in, uh, in digital platforms. And in, I would like to say in parentheses that uh, Professor De Stefano has also uh, signed uh, a manifesto which I think it's called Together with Other Researchers, which is uh, 11 points to save the gig economy, which I would uh, really recommend you to have a look at because there are 11 points that have quite a number of policy implications, both for uh, uh, public authorities, but also for uh, um, the, 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 the social partners, particularly uh, workers' representations by trade union. So with this, uh, I give you the floor, Valerio, for uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you to uh, Dario and Stefano for inviting me to be here. 
uh, it's always great to be back uh, in Rome um, as a researcher that works outside Italy and as an Italian it's great to go to a cafe break when you find uh, Tramezzini which I think they are actually a, a basic human right so um, <laughs> it's very 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 great to be here <laughs> let's say that um, so we have been talking about what uh, the platform economy is uh, a lot uh, during these days and we had uh, also results from surveys um, that show many interesting things about um, the platform economy and how platform workers uh, fare into the labor market. But uh, I think uh, that um, from the legal perspective, we should still um, discuss what is relevant. So what is relevant for lawyers when we discuss about the platform economy? Because surveys normally give us a picture of uh, how much um, workers are paid, is this an additional income, uh, what kind of jobs these people had before, where are they going, etc. Which is all extremely interesting for policy, but in, in legal terms, it's totally irrelevant. It's not relevant to know whether somebody works as a side job or, it's, uh, or as a personal form of income. And actually, this is a, uh, a big part of the platform's narrative. Uh, you shouldn't regulate this because, after all, uh, this is people that don't depend upon this job, they don't need this job, they, they, they are just students that moonlight, etc. Uh, which, in, first of all, is not true, but even if it were true, it wouldn't be relevant uh, in how we should regulate that. Because regulation of labor market is not just about the motivation that drives you into work, but also protecting the labor market more in general. And so um, this is one, uh, one first point that I would like to make. Now, when we talk about platforms from the legal perspective, I mean, Vina and, uh, um, and, and Michele already uh, said a number of very interesting things on this. Uh, we normally um, have a model that is uh, platforms employing uh, independent contractors, self-employed people that normally are excluded from the vast bulk of labor protections. Many in, in many countries around the world, they don't have access to the minimum wage, they don't have access to working time regulation, but in many cases they also don't have access to fundamental rights such as the right to collective bargaining and the right not to be discriminated against at the workplace. Um, and the, what the platforms do is basically uh, engage these people as independent contractors normally, but in, in, other, in some cases uh, the platforms that we all discuss about uh, are people as employees, depending on the national legal framework. For instance, in Germany, Fudora hires their uh, riders as uh, employed workers, waged workers, under the so-called mini-jobs uh, schemes. Uh, and so, uh, in, in some cases, actually, you see that the platforms hire people as employed persons, and we should actually not fall into the idea that employment cannot ever play a role, employment law and, em and employment relationship, because in some cases it's even the same platforms that hire people as employees. So to say this model of employment, this model of work is totally incompatible with employment, uh, it's a sham because they are the first that employ people through employment contracts where the national regulation obliges them to do so. Now, why uh, I think it's relevant to look closely to this uh, self-employment idea? Because uh, normally the platforms say that they only match the demand and supply of work. So say we are basically uh, function as a sort of yellow pages. You want some work to be done and you find workers and that's, that's what happens. Uh, actually, from the legal perspective, that's not true because in many cases the platforms actively intervene in how the work needs to be done, uh, how, uh, how much time you need to employ for a certain job, um, what kind of outfits you should wear, uh, how you should treat customers, how you should greet customers. Um, in some cases, when we talk about digital work, uh, some platforms take screenshots of workers' uh, screens to show the, um, the clients that are actually working when they are paying the workers an hourly wage, an hourly, uh, an hourly pay. And uh, um, they also use rating systems, so they ask customers to rate the workers and use this rating to discipline the workforce. 
and use uh, algorithms and the metrics that the algorithms uh, take from the job, how, my, how fast you are when you deliver uh, something around the city, or uh, if you are an Uber driver, for instance, how fast you um, complete a certain job, how, how fast you break, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all this resembles much closely traditional employment and what traditional employers do, rather than what an independent contractor and their principal do in a self-employment relationship. And I think this is quite important because, uh, as we have seen, Michele and Dina already uh, went into this, we have seen uh, litigations uh, everywhere around the world because uh, the workers say, well, wait a second, I mean, they, I'm classified as an independent contractor, but actually I have not any saying in how I do my work. I don't even have any saying normally in how I charge customers. It's normally it's either the platforms that allow, uh, the, it's either the platform that fixes the, the, the pay, so like if you're a rider or a, a driver, etc. but even when it's not the platform and it's the customers, it's the platform that allows customers to unilaterally fix the pay. So they also intervene. This is a, a way, as Janine would say, of regulating the relationship. It's not true that there's no regulation. It's basically self-regulation unilaterally decided from the platform. Now, again, people around the world start to, um, to uh, challenge this idea that they are uh, all self-employed. And why that is important? It's important because, as I said, if you're an independent contractor, you don't have access to fundamental rights and to basic labor rights such as the minimum wage, working time, et cetera, et cetera. And so people start complaining and say, well, actually, I should be protected. And they file lawsuits all around the world. And uh, in many cases, uh, they lose these lawsuits because the judges fall into a very, um, a very um, shrewd narrative um, picture from the platform that these people are flexible, that they can decide whether to go to work or not and when to be at work or not. They have flexibility of working time, they can decide if and, the, and when they want to work. And normally, normally, uh, judges go for it because we have a uh, tradition, but it's more of a sort of path dependency because actually you don't find necessarily this idea that you cannot be flexible in working time as an employee, but there's this sort of path dependency of associating employment with nine to five standard employment relationship. Uh, but actually employment as a, as a concept can be much wider than that. I am a, a law professor, I am employed, Nobody knows where I am today, and no, no, I didn't have to ask a permission to be here uh, in Rome. Um, nobody bothers, basically. I think the more I stay far from the university, basically, the, the happier they are. But, uh, um, but actually, there's a lot of flexibility also in regular employment. So the idea that flexibility, the idea of flexibility, I know that President Saki has uh, first-hand experience, uh, but actually, you can be flexible, you can have a flexible working time even if you are an employee. Flexibility of employment, the fact that you can decide when to work, doesn't necessarily mean that you don't need to be protected. And doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot be protected already under existing regulation. Uh, this idea that we should only give um, centrality to this factor of being flexible when you work or not, is wrong. And uh, it's wrong in legal terms, but also it's also wrong in policy terms. It doesn't make any sense to exclude uh, workers from the right to collective bargaining because they are flexible in working time, when they have no saying whatsoever in how their prices are fixed, for instance. Um, now, in other cases, uh, but in, in many cases, the workers lost these uh, lawsuits, but there are also examples in Spain and in Belgium in which actually their lawsuits were successful. The judge went beyond the idea that uh, since you are flexible and, when, and decide, you can theoretically decide when to work, uh, you don't need to be protected under uh, traditional employment law. And I want to add something on this. Until we know how the algorithms work, we don't know if you're actually flexible. 
because it's true that nobody tells you you should be there in this uh, place at this point of time, uh, but we don't know if the algorithms penalize people that have an unregular schedule because we don't know how the algorithms factor this instability when they decide how to assign work in the future. And workers, when they answer to survey, they say, well, yes, maybe we don't have uh, an obligation to show up, but actually we know that if we don't show up, we risk to be penalized, we get a, a lower rating, and we don't get any jobs in the future, or, or our shifts are lost for the future. So until we exactly know, and we have transparency on how the algorithms work, and how the work is distributed, and this is not just about uh, working time, but it's also about discrimination. We don't know if, for instance, customers rate me uh, badly because I have a very, um, very marked uh, Italian accent, for instance, and they don't like it. And if they do that and they rate me poorly because I am Italian, there's no way of knowing if that's factoring into the, uh, into the algorithm. So we need to have transparency on how the algorithms work before taking for granted that there is this flexibility. But even if there was this flexibility, it wouldn't make sense to exclude people from fundamental labor protection only because they are flexible in working time when during their shifts they are subject to a stringent control and stringent subordination. Now, what can you do? Basically, what we should do is to uh, have transparency of the data, we should ask the platforms to share the data and actually to negotiate how the algorithm works with the, with the social partner. This is the first thing that I think needs to be uh, accomplished. Secondly, uh, we should not tie protection of employment only to flexibility. And if there's a path dependency of courts that go and identify employment as a nine to five job, we need to pass reforms that break this path of dependency. And, I mean, this was the case, this was basically what was attempted in Italy, and I, and I talk of path dependency because actually, and uh, as uh, Michele has said before, uh, the judge in Turin read a, a provision of the Jobs Act that basically everyone thought it could go in the direction of protecting at least uh, riders and, and gig workers at large, and interpret the provision as if it were useless. The judge says in the judgment, this is a useless provision. Uh, the, the, the lawmaker was wrong, and I'm not going to take this into account. Which, because, the, because we have a path dependency of judges that think that only people with a clear schedule can be regarded as employees. And we need to break it down because actually in our definition of what an employee is, Article 2094 of the Italian Civil Code, we never talk about continuity of obligations. Now, there is a lot of jurisprudence and case law that has developed this concept of continuity, but this was done in a period in which during the shifts there was not the close subordination that now digital tools ensure platforms have. So it doesn't make any sense anymore to refer only to flexibility on this. So we should go beyond this idea that a flexible worker cannot be an employee. We should ask for transparency in, uh, we should ask for transparency in, in algorithms. And we should actually totally make sure that uh, employment law has nothing to do with flexibility, when, especially when it comes to access to fundamental rights, especially when it comes to access to discrimination rights, to uh, union rights, uh, the fact that you are a flexible worker shouldn't prevent you from being protected under labor laws. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio. I think we are adding uh, other elements that are quite interesting. I mean, the issue you raised on also on the need for transparency, which uh, I mean extends, of course, on you know data sharing issues, but as well as on uh, you know having clarity on uh, uh, the contractual arrangements and what are the main elements and the main uh, and the rights uh, that they are. Uh, uh, granted to, to these workers. Of course, by having 
uh, how to say, a strong uh, uh, and non-negotiable uh, area that is that that revolves around human rights and so granting to to these workers uh, the fundamental principles and rights that uh, you mentioned. With this, uh, I will move to uh, Lorenzo Cini. Yeah who is a researcher from uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore of Florence. But also in Pisa. Uh, and also in Pisa. <laughs> he commutes. <laughs> and who will uh, talk about the analytical and political challenges of uh, platform capitalism. And uh, will discuss about his research on uh, the Italian food delivery workers Stop. and also the... Um, uh, what they have done uh, to, uh, what to, say, to act collectively. So you will talk also about, the, again, what was uh, mentioned before uh, yeah. uh, by the first presentation on yeah. uh, the role of uh, a representation of workers. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I also have on the screen the, the slide? Uh, perfect. Okay, it's coming. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to present uh, Thank, a big thanks to the organizer Dario and uh, Stefano. I also have to present apologies from uh, uh, Loris Caruso, who was supposed to be with me today, presenting this paper together, but for a uh, family duty, he could not come, so he won't be able to be here. So I, stay, I just uh, got to know this morning on the train to Rome, so then I have to also do his, do his part, so I will do my best. best. Uh, having said that, I will also uh, a little bit introduce uh, who I am, uh, besides also the nice word that has been uh, elucidated before, in order to situate our research. First of all, it's, a, it's not my research, but it's a research that has, carried out, has been carried out over the last five months. We are just starting this project on uh, digital uh, uh, capitalism and uh, worker struggles in Italy at the School of the of Florence, at the, at the Department of Social Political Science, in affiliated to this uh, uh, research center is called COSMOS, a uh, center on, of social movement studies. I'm saying this just already to give you the clue of our perspective, how we're going to intervene in the debate. So from a sociological perspective, we are going to try to you know, uh, present the viewpoint of, of the workers on this, uh, on this uh, uh, sector. Uh, we just started the project uh, like a few months ago, and uh, our first case study was uh, uh, investigating the, uh, the, the, the so-called uh, food delivery workers in Italy, so the struggles carried out by Fudora, uh, Deliveroo, uh, Tniam, and so on and so forth in, in the three uh, four cities that where they were actually very active. So uh, this is uh, uh, our, uh, uh, our main uh, I mean, uh, research. I will go, we, we just started, so we just uh, have a provisional uh, first round of, of findings, but we also uh, want to uh, proceed with other, I mean, rounds of, uh, of, of investigation, also involving other types of workers in other categories, but this will be a follow-up uh, uh, research in, in, uh, in the near future. Um, some uh, uh, very brief outline of, of this presentation I was supposed to present the first part, uh, Loris, uh, uh, the second one, but anyway, uh, this is uh, uh, the way I will proceed. First, a very brief uh, analytical conceptualization, even though I don't think uh, it's very needed because yesterday and this morning uh, people already presented well the point that I wanted to make on conceptualization. So I will just skip that part and then I will give uh, some uh, descriptive information, background information on uh, the Italian food delivery works and then I will go on the our main fundings of, of our study and finally I will conclude with uh, some political dilemmas, but would even say then po policy applications since given the, the place where we are, that I can maybe figure out, we can discuss together. Uh, so um, speaking of uh, the, what uh, we, we selected as a case study, yeah, as you, I, I'm sure that you are more familiar than me with this uh, very, the growing uh, uh, table that as I actually build on the growing, on the rack on the, like the four types of uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, gig economy uh, uh, types of work that uh, you can, I mean, you can have. And uh, uh, I just uh, um, selected the, 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 the cell on the, on, the, on the right where it is the, the precisely uh, the on food delivery work is, is precisely the, uh, the type of work that I'm going to, we, we are going to, uh, to, to describe today to present the results. So 
uh, unlike uh, Janine, who presented actually the mechanical tool, I will focus more on, on the side of what you presented, Professor Dubal, this morning on, uh, uh, on, on, on Uber. Yeah, um, food, why food delivery workers? I know it seems a little bit, uh, could be from an economic perspective, or like uh, non-intuitive uh, in the sense that, as already been said in the morning, uh, this sector of, uh, uh, of the economy is very, is very small, actually. It's, it's, it's a sub-sector of, of the sector of uh, capitalism. And within this uh, sector, is even, there are very small numbers. So there are no official data. Uh, maybe, um, you can maybe uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, it's around 6,000 uh, workers, the non-official uh, types of workers who are ri riders. They are uh, in, in Italy this, uh, in, in, the, in this year. So, uh, why then uh, we should uh, uh, give se select and study this, uh, this not very uh, numerical uh, important uh, uh, type of work? Of, uh, for at least, according to our view, two reasons. The first one is a scholar reason, in the sense that even though they are not uh, uh, like qu quantitatively uh, a massive uh, type of, uh, of worker, they represent, in our view, an instance of causal job in the, in the current labor market. It's very important to, to investigate also because they are, to a certain extent, they represent the, 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 pre the precarious generation of our time. So they, even though they are a very small part, they represent the wall of a precarious generation working in this condition and the digital economy. So that, that's why uh, it was important to us to, to, to investigate them. And uh, accordingly also, uh, beside the fact that we are uh, interested in uh, uh, looking at the mobilization capacity. So uh, these uh, workers were actually uh, so far uh, the most active in terms of uh, uh, mobilization. So this, in this sense, they were a very uh, visible uh, segment of, of this, uh, this echo. That, that's why uh, forced us uh, to, 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 to investigate them. And then, of course, a, a very important political reason, they are all in the, in the debate also in these weeks uh, about uh, yeah, the, 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 the status of this worker, the working conditions, uh, the fact that uh, we, we tend to have this uh, uh, narrative uh, that has been also over the last year uh, carried out uh, by, by, the, the, by the same uh, uh, companies that uh, these kind of workers are, I mean, part of the new economy of smart cities, environmental friendly, technologically uh, inno innovative. So uh, is what I in our view was important to see and how actually even this smart, uh, actually or not very smart type of work, uh, uh, hides very important uh, working and political issue to be discussed and to be explored. So uh, having said that, I will briefly present uh, the project. Uh, there are, we have uh, two research questions that have been actually uh, the, the driver of, of our investigation for, uh, for these uh, uh, case studies, but also will be also important for the, the future case studies we are going to uh, investigate. We, we, we are thinking of Amazon in, in Italy. Uh, the, the two main questions are, are the following. So uh, investigate, first of all, the working conditions, so uh, to understand what kind of work condition they have compared also to the other uh, type of workers working in similar condition, and then mostly, as uh, we are uh, social movement oriented, uh, looking at the mobilization capacity of, of, of this sector of food delivery workers. So I I'm saying this in order also to, to, certain, to integrate what uh, uh, very convincingly uh, Professor uh, Dubado was uh, saying in the morning, the fact she focused very nicely in the uh, condition inhibiting mobilization, our project was more uh, looking, focusing on the condition, both subjective and contextual, uh, facilitating mobilization. That's why we went as a research design selecting the, the successful case in the sense of mobilization case. And, and so we, we, we got this uh, uh, inspiration and we adopted a social movement perspective. Having said that, it's, it's also important to, uh, it will be maybe done in the future, to, to integrate this uh, selection of cases on successful mobilization, also on cases where there was no, no mobilization in order to integrate the framework. And then our uh, uh, type of methodology is, for the moment, mostly qualitative, also for the lack of data that is on, uh, on the ground and on this, uh, on this sector. 
we, we carry out over the last three months, participatory observation, meeting, strikes, uh, uh, 15, about 15 depth interviews and some informal focus groups uh, with, the, with the, the collective of riders and, uh, and document uh, analysis. So I, I'm not going to say much on, on the working condition because I think it's already been uh, uh, very uh, widely uh, presented uh, in all the sessions from yesterday to this morning. So I will try maybe to, to say some few things and then focus more in five minutes on the, on the part on the mobilization capacity of this worker. Uh, as we all know, uh, it's very uh, hegemonic, it's been very hegemonic, uh, uh, the narration, the narrative of this company, as was also mentioned before, on the fact that we are dealing with uh, uh, free uh, freelancers, free uh, independent contractors who actually uh, are collaborator who join first of all leaving the city by, by, by riding a bike, so a we offer uh, to them like a task, yeah, uh, riding, so we, we, they should be grateful to us. This is uh, the, the, the idea behind uh, uh, this, the, the, the narration of, uh, of, the, of the companies. And we, we all know by now that actually this is not the case, if, because if you look at, uh, if you interview uh, workers, they have a, com a complete opposite narration of their working condition and their relation with the company. And we would have a relation. Of course, objectively, first thing, it was already been said also by, by Valerian and the others, uh, workers' uh, reality. Uh, there weren't uh, no clear uh, regulation, uh, no insurance, at least uh, in the first two years, uh, no sickness leave, no bike maintenance, so all this type of uh, um, important uh, uh, rights that uh, workers should, uh, should have, and they, they were not actually denied by, by, by the company. So since the beginning, because precisely of this uh, 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 freelancer independent contractor narration. Uh, uh, focusing more on the type of, uh, of pay that uh, the, these, uh, these uh, uh, workers have, there are, I think, also surprisingly several uh, uh, heterogeneous, uh, some form of heterogeneous condition if you compare with, with the, the, the various platforms they are now working in Italy. And I'm not talking only about uh, Fudora and Deliveroo and Glovo, but also Just Eat, who is uh, outsourcing to uh, Food Pony, for instance, Sniam, and the other more local uh, type of, uh, uh, of company, who actually uh, have interviewing with, with, with the workers, but also with the dispatcher, three uh, different types of, of pay, hourly wage, uh, peace worker, peace rate system, and, and mix, a mix of them. Uh, none to say that uh, even though we, we might think that uh, uh, these workers, uh, at least at the beginning, claim for, uh, for, for, for hourly wage after the, the first informal type of uh, unilateral, I would say, uh, time of uh, regulation from the company. Uh, now, for instance, in, in several companies, they have only hourly wage. And for looking, for instance, to the, the, the company uh, of uh, Just Eat, uh, Food Pony, it seems quite uh, country intuitive. The fact, okay, so they, they, the workers got uh, uh, hourly wage and they didn't have any more uh, peace work. The actually, uh, uh, is for, for the workers, is, it, uh, as interviewing them, it was actually a, a worsening of their condition because uh, with, the, uh, with the only this option, they also got uh, a lowering of, of their uh, pay per hour. So they cannot have any more, so only the old people uh, recruited last year have a peace work, a mixed type of contract, they only have uh, hourly wage, and it's affecting their condition because actually they are paid less than were before via, uh, via peace work. Uh, regarding the, uh, the composition of these workers, I, I kind of agree with uh, the, the, the illustration presented this morning, the fact that actually there are a divergent heterogeneous type of competition, uh, composition. Uh, mostly the people we interview, and I, I, will, I, I will say in a while why, were mostly uh, students and uh, who are the most active in, uh, in, this, uh, in this strike, in this, uh, in this struggle, but they were also uh, a slight, a strong minority of, of migrants, uh, Iranian, uh, Pakistani, and other type of uh, minorities who are actually uh, having this kind of job as full-time job. So for them it's full-time and not like for the students it's only uh, part-time. It is as very important impact also for the demands and for the implication in terms of policy and organization. Uh, 
uh, of course, I don't need to uh, to say. I mean, uh, depending on the type of of, of, of pay, you have different also type of composition. So in the in the in the company where you have uh, uh, hourly hourly wage. Uh, you, you might have uh, much more uh, uh, migrants well, uh, uh, why, uh, where in, uh, you, you have uh, in the few companies that they still have a, a mixed type of uh, uh, pay, you have, uh, you have uh, like a majority of, of students. Um, I'm not going to say anything on algorithm as you know, invisible uh, because it's quite visible for them and just to want to stress uh, on the, uh, would say, determinants, conditions, both subjective and uh, uh, contextual, uh, facilitating uh, the mobilization uh, of, of this worker. Uh, I, I, like, I, I really like the presentation today because the certain sense it's, it's a complementary to, to what uh, Professor uh, on Uber was saying before, uh, in the sense that, yeah, uh, the, the condition, contextual uh, condition facilitating mobilization are actually, first of all, the visibility of these workers, the fact that they can dress also uh, the, 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 the Fudora and the Deliveroo uh, uh, type of uh, t-shirt, and they can uh, meet, uh, they even um, met on, on, the, on the open spaces such as Square, where they start to know each other, and they start to then start to share their problems, and so they start to organize. And then the second step, second phase of open, uh, relatively less open space of encounter, were then represented by uh, Italian uh, squat place, social center, cause house of the people, and arch, RC circle. So these were actually mostly the places where they were actually gathering in order to, to organize their own uh, struggles and, and to, to share their problems. And a very important uh, uh, tool of communication and also of organization of struggles has been represented. I was surprised in the body so far spoke about it, about uh, WhatsApp chats. They had actually, of course, also company chat, but they also managed to, to clone to a certain extent, to, to build on, on the contacts of the, of the, of the chat, uh, of the company chat, in order to create their own chats, in which to, to present, to, 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 change infor to exchange information, to share problem problems, is also to organize uh, strikes and, uh, and events of protest. Uh, regarding the, the triggering uh, actors, this I would like to, to say more words because maybe it's more also related to the policy implication of the, of the final slide. Uh, well, uh, these uh, actors are mostly the, 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 the actors who are beyond the struggle, who are start the initiator, the triggering actor, are what you, you might realize the most uh, uh, resourceful in the sense uh, uh, in, of, of uh, social and, and political resources. They are actually. Yeah, uh, in terms of education, the most educated, in terms of skill, also already uh, previously politicized in, in, uh, or socialized in other types of, uh, of collectives, in other types of, uh, you know, organization. And they, they can share their own knowledge and also involve also people who are not, who are not previously socialized, so re real workers. So a very important, uh, actually, uh, we'll say backbone of, of these struggles were actually represented by the informal networks of activists. So they were actually uh, sharing, outsourcing, a very bad word in this sense, their own knowledge in order to trigger protest and to connect, to involve uh, participants and workers in the struggle. So, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, repertoire action, uh, they, they started to, 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 to a certain extent, to invent new, new forms of protest, uh, strike, strike uh, uh, bike demos, but also forms of uh, uh, availability to, 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 to work. But uh, uh, comparing in to, 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 this, to this type of struggle to the other struggles, for instance, of Amazon uh, uh, workers, also to the uh, factory workers, I would say that uh, given the, the lack of what in labor study you can say structural power, uh, the real uh, power on which they, they, they can rely is this brand, brand and shaming. The fact that, as we are presenting before, since the, the narration and narrative of the company is, is quite to be oriented to uh, friendly uh, f uh, of, uh, of environment, uh, of uh, technology innovation, the fact that they can actually unmask behind uh, this uh, uh, narration rhetoric, the fact that they are actually embedded in power relation, uh, worse in the working condition of, 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 this, of this worker, was, was, has been a very powerful, I would say, weapon that has also, in my view, in our view, attracted public opinion in the Italian case, it was quite uh, compelling this, uh, I mean, uh, attention to the public opinion, public opinion uh, uh, 
got and uh, gave to, to this uh, sector of, of workers. And you, you might see also in the media, if you now uh, uh, call an assembly of, of, of workers, as it was at the National Assembly in Bologna, you, you got media. You got media, even though there were like 50, no more than 100 actually workers uh, uh, gathering that. And this precisely, I think, for this you know, powerful uh, power that they can have, so brain shaming, the fact they can unmask uh, the real, uh, uh, present a counter nation against this, uh, this, this, act, this, this company. Uh, regarding political demand, well, uh, I'm not saying much uh, uh, respect to what that has been said by other presenters before. Of course, other uh, work at the related issues, especially uh, insurance, but also uh, the, this, the legal status of, uh, of the work. Even though on this, I would like to maybe make a distinction in the sense that, as uh, uh, rightly you all said, for the case of Uber, uh, the, the, the demands of uh, full-time uh, demands of full-time workers are, are different than the demands of part-time workers. So full-time workers are tend to, to be more, of course, uh, um, uh, willing, eager to, to have uh, the, the employee status. Uh, while in the case of uh, the, the students, uh, some students are, no, we, we are just, you know, uh, I, I do for part-time, I, I don't need, uh, and maybe I don't, I don't have, flex they, 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 they think that we don't have uh, enough flexibility, but on this respect, uh, what I was suggesting before, uh, uh, Valerio could be actually a nice response in order to, to make them be also more uh, willing to accept, uh, yeah, perfect minutes, but to accept also a, a kind of uh, a status of employee uh, without uh, uh, denying certain um, flexible uh, conditions. Um, the final uh, um, uh, slide on which I will, I will stress on, I mean, let's say policy implication, uh, is, is the following one. I mean, technological determinist, we all know what, what is it. I think yesterday it has been widely discussed. So I won't stress anything just to say that we should maybe, in the line that uh, Valerio was uh, uh, discussing, trying to uh, mask or make the algorithm transparent, maybe bargaining with algorithm, I, I don't know yet uh, what, what would be, I mean, the, the best solution on, on this, but yeah, it's something has to be uh, put in the agenda. So also the workers, uh, workers, uh, uh, workers struggles. Uh, on this ambivalent uh, legal uh, status has been already said uh, a lot before, so I want only stress on, on the last side, uh, the last uh, point, collective action in precarity, actually to, to suggest or, or at least uh, to, to discuss certain potential, I mean, um, tactics of, of cooperation between different actors that are actually a part of, uh, of this uh, uh, process of uh, representation and organization of workers. The fact that, for instance, in the case of uh, the Italian food delivery workers, a strong component of actor mobilizing were actually part of a social, what we can call social movements, informal actors, such as networks of uh, collectives, uh, of political areas, social centers, uh, and type of other uh, organization, might suggest that rather than uh, present or figure out a conflicting relation with the, with the existing unions, we might have a sort of cooperative type of relation. So uh, in literally there is already this uh, very catchy uh, uh, terminology of social unionism, the fact that actually uh, in order to, you know, uh, to present certain, you know, peculiarity of, of uh, social, social movements that have been uh, over the last uh, uh, 15 years quite, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, powerful weapon in order to organize certain sectors of society, maybe uh, unions could rely on certain legal tactics and also cooperate with certain actors uh, acting in this field of, of, uh, of uh, in the social view, rather than try to, to be competitive. So also to avoid like a uh, situation like the last week in Italy, where you had actually certain uh, um, different press uh, release, uh, uh, like accusing each other of uh, between different fields. So this is my suggestion, try to be more cooperative in order to maybe uh, the, the two actors can rely on layer different type, types of strategy or resources in order to be more uh, effective, in order to claim more uh, 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 rights for, the, for this type of worker. So thanks uh, for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a very interesting presentation. I, I just take on two things uh, to conclude, and then we have uh, a short Q and A se section. One is uh, relating to the, um, how to say, to the number of workers that they are involved in, in these types of work and the attention that it's put into it. Uh, 
uh, my reflection is that uh, um, you know this issue of how to 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 organize, how to regulate this uh, this new or these new forms of work. Uh, somehow also uh, they, there is a great deal of attention because of the transmission effects that these can have on other segments of the of the economy. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, that there is uh, how to avoid the danger of, uh, you know, a race to the bottom in terms of uh, rights and entitlements for workers. The other one is that uh, in terms of uh, organization and representation of these workers, there are a number of uh, very interesting practices. Uh, I mean, in the ILO we have dealt with uh, uh, other work types of workers that they operate, they work in unstructured uh, situations, namely, for instance, workers in the informal economy. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, however, also a number of interesting, uh, uh, how to say, practices on how to organize and represent and give voice to workers uh, in the gig economy. And uh, there is a working paper that has been uh, recently published by two of our colleagues, the, which I will give uh, the, um, the PDF uh, to, to the colleagues, to, to Stefano and, uh, and Dario, if you can share it with all colleagues. This I promised to Lorenzo of the Italian Con General Confederation of Trade Unions, so otherwise I would have uh, left it with you. Um, with this, I, I would like to make a, to open up the floor for Q and A's for all the six presenters of this morning, and uh, what we could do is that we can have uh, a few rounds of uh, questions, and then uh, President Saki is proposing that after the lunch break, those who are interested in. Uh, uh, deepening the discussion or addressing uh, uh, questions and issues, uh, we will all be invited to his office. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will have drinks uh, in uh, mm -hmm. Professor Saki's Gin office. And tonic, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> so, um, why don't you raise your hand uh, if you want to? Yes. And you can also introduce yourself while. Uh, you, you take the floor. I, um, uh, I would apologize uh, if I will speak uh, in Italian, but uh, I have not uh, prepared anything about the speech, and then I'm afraid that to uh, to make mis uh, technical to say the technicalities uh, that could be uh, misunderstood. Uh, mi chiamo Umberto Carabelli, sono il direttore della rivista giuridica del lavoro, eh, una rivista che fa capo alla EDS, l'editrice del, uh, del sindacato della Confederazione Sindacale CGL. Eh, sono un paio di anni che come rivista ci interessiamo al tema della, uh, della uh, gig economy e abbiamo fatto anche dei lavori abbastanza importanti, segnalo a tutti se sono interessati, c'è un quaderno, oltre che il numero due eh, della rivista dell'anno scorso, c'è anche un quaderno che raccoglie gli atti di un convegno di fine anno su questo tema. E posso, vorrei mh, a questo riguardo, purtroppo io nel pomeriggio non mi potrò soffermare, quindi in realtà si tratta sì di domande, ma più di eh, provocazioni in qualche modo alle relazioni di eh, eh, Faioli e di De Stefano, eh, provocazioni legate al fatto che eh, hanno introdotto alcuni eh, temi che secondo me sono molto importanti per affrontare nel prossimo futuro la questione delle tutele di questi lavoratori. Allora intanto eh, mi è piaciuto molto sentire nella relazione di, Fagio di Faioli eh, eh, la rilevazione di qualcosa che anche noi stiamo sentendo nelle indagini che stiamo facendo, e cioè un avvicinamento fortissimo tra i metodi di riorganizzazione eh, informatico-tecnologica nelle imprese di manifattura e eh, quelle che chiamiamo abitualmente piattaforme di distribuzione dei servizi. La nostra impressione, la mia impressione in particolare, è che la piattaforma stia diventando e diventerà sempre di più nel futuro il paradigma 
di organizzazione del lavoro nelle imprese tanto di manifattura quanto di servizi e questo naturalmente inciderà profondamente sulle modalità del lavoro comunque prestato, dovunque prestato. L'aspetto più significativo è sicuramente l'emersione di fenomeni di avvicinamento tra la subordinazione e l'autonomia, le due grandi categorie con le quali abbiamo conosciuto il lavoro nel secolo scorso. E eh, questo eh, significa che dobbiamo stare molto attenti a eh, produrre partizioni che eh, potrebbero causare difficoltà di offrire tutele ad ampio raggio. Se cioè noi concentriamo l'idea di tutela sul processo di qualificazione di una concreta situazione lavorativa all'interno di una di, di queste realtà, ripeto, siano esse realtà del mondo della produzione manifatturiera quanto del mondo dei servizi attraverso le piattaforme di cui stiamo parlando in questa sede, io temo che rischieremo di fare altre ingiustizie, di creare ulteriori frammentazioni di protezioni che eh, non credo siano nell'interesse di nessuno in questa fase. La tendenza deve essere invece quella di riscontrare le omogeneità e di redefinire forme di tutela che siano indipendenti dalla natura specifica del lavoro che viene prestato. Da questo punto di vista segnalo che l'articolo 2 richiamato stamattina da eh, Faioli, l'articolo 2 del decreto legislativo 81, si muove in questa direzione, quantunque io credo nella mente del legislatore a suo tempo, non nella prospettiva di un allargamento generale delle tutele, ma a finalità antidiscriminatorie o anti, eh, diciamo, fraudolente meglio. Io credo cioè che eh, la possibilità di dire qualunque sia la modalità con cui tu impresa utilizzi il lavoro è una modalità che richiede comunque delle forme di tutela, di protezione e decidere poi quali forme di tutela estendere a questi lavoratori. La CGL ad esempio nella carta dei diritti che ha presentato come progetto di legge nella scorsa legislatura ma che verrà discussa nella nuova legislatura perché esso vale anche in questa come eh, progetto di legge popolare per la quale sono state raccolte più di un milione di firme eh, prevede che nel titolo primo prevede per l'appunto che ci sia una, eh, un insieme di tutele che sono indifferenti dalla natura giuridica del rapporto di lavoro eh, che viene concretamente prestato c'è un altro aspetto al quale, eh, su cui voglio eh, soffermarmi e cioè che eh, in realtà eh, il eh, lavoro eh, della, eh, della gig economy, insomma il lavoro delle piattaforme si specifica eh, al momento per una grande confusione anche di, eh, come dire, di modalità con le quali vengono utilizzati eh, eh, i giovani, ma non soltanto giovani, abbiamo visto un servizio di report, della trasmissione report, ci sono anche eh, cinquantenni che eh, viaggiano sulle, nostre, sulle biciclette che attraversano la città. Bene, eh, le modalità sono estremamente diverse, si va da forme di utilizzo di un rapporto di lavoro eh, subordinato, forme di utilizzo di rapporti di lavoro a collaborazione coordinata e continuativa, forme di lavoro occasionale. Bene, se è vero che le piattaforme tecnologicamente evolveranno sempre di più per ottimizzare l'utilizzo dei soggetti, io temo che quanto più noi ci affidiamo a regole che standardizzano le tutele su certe caratteristiche, sarà più facile per le piattaforme modificare le regole di ingaggio e sottrarsi continuamente alle tutele. Sarà cioè un inseguimento permanente. Ecco perché ritengo che occorre chiudere le vie di fuga, unificare le tutele e dire che qualunque sia la forma di utilizzo del lavoro spettano alcune tutele fondamentali. Chiudo dicendo a questo riguardo, ricordiamoci che almeno in Italia, ma credo in tutta Europa, stante il trattato, sia praticamente impossibile pretendere di imporre ad una piattaforma l'utilizzo di un modello regolativo unico, cioè di usare soltanto lo schema del lavoro subordinato, lo schema della collaborazione, lo schema del lavoro autonomo, occasionale o altro. Io credo che questo fa parte della libertà di iniziativa economica d'impresa. 
ma è evidente che nel momento in cui noi tendiamo ad unificare le tutele, unifichiamo anche i costi per le imprese e dunque la scelta della soluzione qualificatoria diventerà assai meno importante. L'impresa la sceglierà sulla base della sua concreta utilità mm. e non sulla base dei costi. Scusate se sono no, stato... No, 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 grazie mille, grazie. Eh, se qualcuno vuole intervenire in italiano o in inglese oppure in francese e spagnolo? Telegraficamente coloro che i colleghi che vogliono fare interventi anche eh, diciamo più articolati ricordo che dopo pranzo ci sarà questa, questa continuazione quindi siete tutti invitati a partecipare brevemente prego I, I apologize for speaking uh, uh, yeah, Italian sorry. Okay. sorry 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 i apologize for speaking in Italian. Ah, no, non, ci, non si eh, preoccupi. Italiano, Abbiamo okay. gli <ride> sì, sì. interpreti che ringraziamo anche per il grande lavoro che hanno fatto in questi due giorni. Sono bravissimi. E quindi allora. possiamo parlare sia in inglese che in italiano, senza problemi. Prego. Allora, brevissimamente, io credo, ma in parte chi mi ha preceduto lo ha detto, io sono della CISL, quindi anch'io come eh, confederazione sindacale, eh, e noi dobbiamo sicuramente, almeno come CISL, stiamo facendo una riflessione per la quale eh, puntiamo a dare delle tutele, dico di più, anche contrattuali, al di là di quelle legislative, a questi lavoratori. Perché in qualunque posto, in qualunque modo, ci sia una prestazione lavorativa e c'è qualcuno che utilizza quella prestazione lavorativa, alcune tutele è chiaro che noi dobbiamo approntarle. Quindi al di là della qualificazione, lo diceva chi mi ha preceduto, noi anche contrattualmente stiamo ragionando su come eh, riuscire, magari con degli accordi eh, pilota, con le grandi, si parte dalla questione dei rider, sappiamo che non è solo rider, quindi c'è un ragionamento eh, in corso eh, come CISL e credo che insomma, presto parleremo anche con le altre confederazioni. E, eh, le difficoltà sono molte, la, la professoressa Diubal questa mattina sul caso Uber le metteva in evidenza, sono molto atomizzati e hanno degli ehm, interessi non sempre convergenti questi lavoratori, perché non tutti eh, hanno l'interesse ad essere eh, lavoratori dipendenti, quindi noi come sindacato di questo dobbiamo tener conto. Fermo restando ciò, avevo oh, una domanda, non so... Eh, Bene, per chi forse per il professor Faioli, insomma per chi ha toccato, lui in particolare ma non solo, per chi ha toccato la questione eh, della eh, qualificazione e anche il professor De Stefano che ha fatto notare che eh, come dire, noi si continua ad assumere che si possa essere flessibili solo da dipendenti e non è così, mi ha colpito l'ultima frontiera del lavoro agile e il lavoro agile in Italia nasce con una legge che dice che è il lavoro dipendente, è dipendente ma è agile, ma è smart, quindi insomma ecco, eh, attenzione a queste dicotomie così nette. Però ecco, fermo restando ciò, mi chiedevo su questo eh, famigerato articolo 2 del Giozet, del decreto legislativo 81, che noi all'epoca abbiamo salutato con, in maniera positiva perché eh, l'intento eh, per noi è stato chiaramente quello di allargare le tutele del lavoro subordinato, non certo di restringerle, però la mia sensazione, lo chiedo in particolare al professor Faioli, la mia sensazione è che non è superato dai fatti, non è già obsoleto, cioè non ci siamo neanche resi conto in due o tre anni, eh, non è diventato già obsoleto semplicemente per il fatto che basa eh, diciamo il... Um, L'ampliamento delle tutele del lavoro subordinato, diciamo, dà l'ampliamento delle tutele del lavoro subordinato soltanto a quelle collaborazioni in cui c'è il coordinamento spazio-temporale. La tecnologia, la nuova tecnologia, consente appunto che, eh, diciamo, che, che, che ci sia eh, lavoro dipendente anche senza nessun tipo di coordinamento spazio-temporale. Quindi entriamo un po' in contraddizione. Vorrei capire se abbiamo un'idea di come eh, modificarlo, se questo può essere una cosa eh, sensata da fare. Mille grazie. Grazie. Uh, any other question? Yes? Just a question, Thank you. please. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go briefly. Just the questions. Yes. Uh, And um, we can discuss later on okay, after lunch. Okay, we can discuss later, maybe. And um, so maybe I can uh, argument this later. Um, 
The first question for everyone, especially uh, Professor De Stefano, because uh, he wrote um, um, an, interest, uh, an interesting essay, it's not yet publicated, maybe, uh, on the neg negotiating the, the algorithm. Okay. Um, should, should we consider uh, the algorithm as the actual um, node or subject in, in some way of power? Um, of course, I should uh, argument this. And the second question is, uh, um, should then the code architecture of um, uh, the platforms should be, should be regulated? Because if, the, if we don't know, uh, we, can, we can know because there is intellectual property on the uh, algorithms that um, uh, operate in the platform, uh, we can't absolutely know um, if there is uh, actually an exercise of um, discrimination or so on. So should we regulate the code production and the uh, architecture? Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, I would give back the floor to our panelists. First, uh, I think that in, on the juridical legal issues, I would rely very much upon Michele and Valerio. Michele, you want to... Sì, rispondo in italiano, poi se volete lo dico pure in inglese, perché la traduzione potrebbe tradire quello che dico e quindi non voglio essere frainteso. Allora, io condivido l'impostazione che Valerio e Geremia, Valerio De Stefano e Geremia Sprassa l'hanno scritto in più occasioni, muovendo dall'idea che tutto ciò che è gig economy è di fatto una dissimulazione, loro la chiamano strategic dissimulation, è interessantissimo, ovviamente parlano dall'idea che c'è qualcosa che non va. Ma questo noi già lo conosciamo, cioè vogliamo parlare dei cococò, -co lavoro a progetto, noi abbiamo gli anticorpi nel nostro sistema perché abbiamo avuto una malattia, diciamo, e ce l'abbiamo ancora, diciamo così, quasi un virus. Io sono convinto, e qui io spero di non scandalizzare il professor Carabelli perché sono molto legato a lui per varie ragioni, ma anche diciamo, alla scuola di Bari, io credo che noi giuristi, non so se Valerio condivide con me, però insomma, noi dobbiamo, a mio avviso, smettere, cioè dovremmo uscire da questa benedetta bipartizione lavoro autonomo e lavoro subordinato. Nel futuro noi avremo il lavoro che domina la tecnologia e il lavoro che è dominato dalla tecnologia. Questo significa smantellare molti libri e treccani e enciclopedie, vedo la direttora, di, dei giuristi del lavoro che hanno scritto su questa distinzione e bisogna mettersi in una nuova logica, perché... O già lo si diceva, lo diceva Vardaro negli anni Ottanta, però vale ancora di più oggi, lo diceva pure Giugni per alcuni versi, però domani varrà ancora di più la distinzione è tra chi domina, quelle, quelle, ci sono quelle mansioni, quei lavori che, sono, che dominano la tecnologia, quindi c'è un apporto intellettuale importantissimo, e ahimè quei lavori, quelle figure professionali, quelle mansioni, bla bla bla, che sono dominate e su quello bisogna ri, 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 ridefinire il sistema delle, delle, delle tutele. La carta della CGL secondo me ha tra gli elementi positivi quella di individuare, anche seguendo una tradizione che se ricordo bene risale anche a qualche anno fa, all'individuazione di uno statuto dei diritti, minimo, ampio, questo poco importa. Certo si può partire da questa impostazione, però tenendo a mente che forse quella distinzione autonomo subordinato ahimè non ci porta da nessuna parte, quindi quei diritti vanno riragionati mettendo mano a questa distinzione. Chiuso diciamo, come primo feedback. Secondo, il Jobs Act non è, questo insomma, lo dico alla, uh, in generale, secondo me non è né nuovo né antico, secondo me ha centrato perché ha consolidato una tradizione, un, un'impostazione un già esistente nel nostro ordinamento. Quell'articolo 2 ha, a mio avviso, un problema ed è un problema che con una semplice riforma normativa si può eliminare, cancellando da anche fino al lavoro, perché voi sapete che si dice che la, il, diciamo, vengono applicate queste tutele di lavoro subordinato a chi svolge esclusivamente continuativamente e così via, attività anche con riferimento a tempi. Se noi togliamo anche, che, è stato, che io sappia è stato voluto fortemente dalla tecnostruttura del Ministero, non dalla parte politica di chi ha ragionato, eh, di chi ha ragionato sul Jobs Act, secondo me se si elimina 
quella anche si tolgono, magari chi la, la tecnostruttura l'ha voluta per ragioni ispettive, immagino, non so, mh, hanno fatto valere delle cose eh, del passato, però se togliessimo quell'anche avremmo una forza. In più, e questo lo dico alla CISL, pensando a CGL e Will, tutte e tre insieme, quel benedetto articolo 2 ha un comma 2 che rimette nelle vostre mani la responsabilità di intervenire su figure come queste. Allora l'avete fatto per i call center, ma perché non lo fate per i gig worker? No, di inserirla, perché... Eh, di estendere, il comma 2 dice sì, è un modo per estendere quelle tutele, però poi si può dire certo non tutte parzialmente, però va bene, intanto facciamo un primo sforzo perché questo significa anche recuperare in termini di strategia sindacale un terreno che non mi pare che al momento sia coperto da CGL, CISL e Will. Ecco, punto. Grazie. Grazie. Um, Valerio, and then I would also like to have a final word or if you want to to pick to quick to Yeah, yeah, no one minute each because I think it's important to give the the floor to all the panelists. Um, vabbè, anche io adesso intervengo in italiano così ho imparato. Uh, Molto, molto velocemente. A bit slowly, eh? because I sì. saw the colleague there doing the, your interpretation with a big headache, because you were running. <ride> ok, allora, lenta, lentamente ma velocemente, perché qua, se no, mi intrappongo fra, fra voi e il pranzo. E, allora, in primo luogo, io sono assolutamente d'accordo che bisogna superare la dicotomia quando parliamo di tutele, nel senso che anche la nostra carta costituzionale in Italia... <ride> Eh, diciamo, dispone che la Repubblica tutela il lavoro in qualunque sua forma e applicazione, quindi questo è chiaro ehm, e quindi io sono assolutamente per ridiscutere il campo di applicazione delle tutele ed estendere al, soprattutto le tutele sui diritti fondamentali del lavoro, la libertà di contrattazione collettiva, la, la non discriminazione eh, ai lavoratori autonomi eh, cosa che già la nostra carta costituzionale ci consente di fare ma Riparliamone ancora perché c'è bisogno di parlarne. Eh, però un attimo, cioè nel senso mi va benissimo questo, ma non possiamo non vedere che alcuni degli, eh, dei modelli organizzativi che si usano nell'economia delle piattaforme sono lavoro subordinato. Se io sono controllato e monitorato on, mh, al minuto con un GPS e la mia piattaforma sa dove vado, se poi sono eh, il, il rating mi disciplina e mi caccia una piattaforma, se sono lento, se il, cons il consumatore è lento, eccetera, eccetera. Per me quella è subordinazione. Io non, non, e, e secondo me bisogna anche partire da qui, perché se no ci, ci vuole anche una certa legittimazione politica e qui secondo me il, il punto non è solamente estendiamo le tutele ad altri, ma ci sono dei lavoratori che dovrebbero già essere tutelati per quella che è la normativa vigente. Sull'articolo 2 non mi dilungo perché abbiamo già detto tanto, secondo me però un, una cosa fatemi da dire, non è che siccome il giudice di Torino ha interpretato l'articolo 2 in maniera assurda, allora noi l'articolo 2 oggi lo dobbiamo buttare via, non, non è così, cioè è stata una sentenza di primo grado, ha detto una certa cosa, vabbè viva Dio, faremo appello, si farà appello, vediamo come va, però non è che l'articolo 2 da oggi in poi ce lo dimentichiamo. Eh, venendo alla seconda domanda, è l'algoritmo eh, la questione? Certo l'algoritmo è una questione importantissima, il problema è chi ha il controllo dell'algoritmo, cioè l'algoritmo per sé è, sono numeri, eh, no, un attimo, uh, uh, sono gli, gli algoritmi sono uh, controllati dalle persone, vengono settati in una certa maniera e la responsabilità è chi, di chi controlla il coding, eccetera, eccetera. E che sia proprietà intellettuale di qualcuno, chi se ne frega, il potere direttivo datoriale del datore di lavoro, soprattutto in Italia abbiamo la procedimentalizzazione dei proteri del datore di lavoro, se tu utilizzi l'algoritmo per dare indicazioni, ordini direttive e potere disciplinare, quello deve essere normato come la catena di montaggio, cioè non è che a un certo punto siccome eh, gli ordini arrivavano con la catena di montaggio e non più con uno che ti diceva fai questo e quest'altro, allora quello non era, più il, eh, non era più lavoro subordinato, nessuno si è sognato di dire una scemenza del genere 40 anni fa, non si capisce per quale motivo adesso gli algoritmi sono la proprietà privata, e va bene, saranno proprietà privata, ma viva Dio, da sempre si interviene per la procedimentalizzazione dei poteri del datore di lavoro. Thank you. Uh, of, of course you can continue over lunch. I didn't want to, to interrupt the flow, but 
I would like to give the floor now to Professor Dubal because sure. you wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to um, respond to both both comments, and, um, and I'm in complete agreement with Valerio. Um, and going to the first gentleman's comment about sort of uh, the problematics of typologizing these platforms even beyond the employee and independent contractor dichotomy and trying to regulate in that way, I think it's right that we will always be behind the business model if we do it that way as opposed to just providing safety net protection. So one study that I did um, looked at previous forms of gig work, offline gig work, so tr um, FedEx truck drivers who have been independent contractors in the U.S. since the early 1990s. Um, taxi workers and, um, and two, two instances of taxi workers and in all three instances in really amazing litigation workers won employee status in multi-billion dollar litigation they won employee status at the appellate level in the US and the cap company just changed their business model they used the actual decision to say oh this makes us look like an employer we'll stop doing that and in the end the workers were in more precarious conditions so I think that that's part of the reason working within the dichotomy is really problematic um, and then to this idea of, you know, I think that uh, you also agree that fetishizing the algorithm is a huge problem. People make algorithms, people direct the creation of algorithms, and in addition to regulating the creation of these algorithms, I've been um, observing in the U.S. among computer scientists the creation, and I don't think this is the answer, but it's interesting, the creation of, um, of ethical uh, commitments around what engineers should be willing to do and what they won't be able to do. So in Google in particular, there are some ethical commitments that engineers have been making with regard to the creation of artificial intelligence that can be used in war. Um, and so it's sort of exciting to see, um, you know, people outside the social scientists and human, social science and humanities thinking about the real sort of commitments that they're making and the, the worlds that they're creating when they put these numbers together. Thank you very much. Finally, yes. <laughs> So, Professor Pulignano, would you like to, to add something or to greet our... E dato che tutti gli italiani hanno parlato italiano, parlo anche io italiano. Allora, eh, dunque, io eh, semplicemente da una visione un po' più sociologica, però con, come dire, una simpatia alle relazioni industriali. Eh, sono d'accordo con il discorso appunto che bisogna superare i confini tra lavoro subordinato e lavoro autonomo, mi chiedo eh, quali implicazioni da un punto di vista sociologico questo potrebbe avere e secondo me eh, un'implicazione ce l'ha perché significa che bisogna superare la dicotomia tra lavoro pagato, il paid e l'unpaid work. Eh, quella è una cosa secondo me importantissima anche perché è vero che bisogna estendere le tutele, però è anche vero che nelle società, le società le sappiamo, hanno dei processi, delle dinamiche di inclusione e di esclusione. Andiamo a vedere chi sono i lavoratori che lavorano sulle digital platform, la maggior parte sono giovani. E lì c'è anche una responsabilità da parte degli attori sociali, non solo dei governi, ma soprattutto dei sindacati, di essere vicini a questa popolazione. Adesso non voglio, come dire, eh, 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 indirizzarmi in maniera... Eh, 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 come dire, di risposta al sindaco, però è importante, quindi bisogna, eh, e questa è la, 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 reale, la reale sfida, bisogna avvicinarsi a quelli che sono i gruppi che sono esclusi da un punto di vista sociale nelle nostre società e che diventano sempre e sempre più grandi, tra i giovani, le donne, che, di, che sono poi le cosiddette vulnerable groups. Quindi lì io farei anche attenzione, eh, quindi guardare sì da un punto di vista le protezioni, la tutela, però tener conto del fatto che le nostre società, la, nostra, la società per definizione, ha un elemento eh, basilare che è quello dell'ineguaglianza sociale. E queste ineguaglianze stanno crescendo enormemente, perché per, vabbè, lì bisognerebbe ragionarci sopra, però è importante quindi tener conto di questi aspetti secondo me anche nell'analisi, sì, nell grazie. Grazie, thank you. Janine? Puedes hablar italiano o español como quieres. Portugués. <laughs> Portugués. Yeah, I'll speak in English. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, jointly with Valerio, we launched a report at the end of 2016 on non-standard employment around the world, a global report looking at the phenomenon of the growth of non-standard employment, so much beyond the gig economy. And after this, I mean, our, our main conclusion was that regardless of, of your contractual status, you should be treated equally. And I think that that's really the way that it has to go. So I agree with you know, the other commentators and, and what they said. You know, if you're working part time after one hour of work, you should still have the same rights and the same benefits of all workers who are working full time. 
Uh, and if you're in some sort of dependent contractual arrangement, you also should have the same benefits. And if, if you have that argument, then at least if, the, if when the employers say that they need the flexibility, well, then they're needing, then they're actually using that job because of the flexibility it brings, not because it's cheaper, uh, not because it's a way to lower uh, wage costs. And so I think that that's really the, 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 the approach that we should be taking. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Cini. Thanks. Uh, very briefly on, okay, I kind of agree on what has been said uh, so far. So I just want to add two, two other things. The fact that I, I, I think that first, before actually discussing if an algorithm or uh, we need more flexibility or more uh, rigidity, I think there is, I mean, an issue uh, broader that is the issue of, uh, I mean, what also has been also touched on before, uh, what is, what has become labor uh, today. So I, I think that the main distinction is also, and we should first discuss uh, between uh, paid labor and non-paid labor. So this is the main, I mean, I think, line of, of, of reflection on which we should try to, to figure out some solution. And in order to, you know, to make also what is not paid labor be paid. And that is also, in my view, an issue of, uh, of power relation in the end, in the sense that uh, flexibility, I remember like 20 years ago, was considered like uh, the, the even of everything, but then we realized that it became a worse precarity. So flexibility can be, I mean, a good thing for worker if there is real I mean, freedom to choose for the worker their condition, the right, the free to move, free to, to decide the time of labor, otherwise it becomes precarity. So I think there is uh, on the back an issue of power relation. And on this actually unions and the organization workers should, should do more. So on this, on this actually we should focus also the debate beside also the rightly judicial uh, regulation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Just, uh, uh, I mean, I wanted to thank all of you for uh, your attention and also for having uh, this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentations. I wanted to thank particularly Professor Saki and Dario and the management and colleagues from INAP for having invited us and for having organized this one. And with this, uh, I give the floor back to Professor Saki for the Okay, thank you. Since I had to speak Italian uh, uh, at the beginning of the session, I will be speaking English at the end. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm very attached to the idea of providing, you know, uh, 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 the same rights and the, the, you know, the same uh, uh, level of protection to uh, all workers and also non-workers in, uh, uh, in a society, um, I've been writing about that since 2008, 2009, flexing security now. Um, however, when we, speak, when we speak of social protection, social protection is costly. And who pays for that? And uh, with adverse, extremely adverse demography, particularly in some countries, Italy and Germany, much less so in other countries, France, um, and a shrinking tax base. Because, I mean, it's easy to uh, say, okay, we need uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, more uh, 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 social protection rights, and, uh, but who pays for them? And, uh, um, and in terms of uh, shrinking tax base, uh, 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 the, the issue, I mean, it is, it is the, 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 there is an issue that looms large. We discussed that yesterday and also today and probably will continue uh, for uh, uh, quite a long time. The issue of the appropriation and immediately after redistribution of surplus, surplus and productivity gains uh, connected to the uh, technological uh, change. Anyway. Um, I would like to thank each and all of you so much for being here, for staying here for two days. Um, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists from flying from all over uh, uh, the world to uh, 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 allow us uh, uh, to have what I consider a very successful uh, 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 symposium or seminar and uh, uh, lots of food for thought. Um, I would also like to uh, uh, thank uh, the structure of uh, uh, ENAP and the administration, there's the Director General here who made this possible, and uh, uh, all uh, uh, the uh, workers uh, uh, who, uh, uh, who worked, uh, who made this uh, possible, and uh, last but not least, of course, Dario Guarascio for uh, organizing this. Now there's a lunch. 
Uh, for those of you who would like to discuss this uh, further, also, I mean, in terms of possible uh, both research collaboration and cooperation and uh, publication, and the two are generally one and the same, uh, uh, um, you can come to uh, uh, my office, uh, sixth floor, uh, uh, after, after lunch, but uh, I will guide you there. Okay, thank you so much again. <laughs>